we are in order. And it looks like everyone is here today. Thank you. Item number one is discussion, approval, disapproval regarding the 2022 Pinal County primary election handling, follow up by staff, after action report, and all the rest of that stuff. Ms. Ross, you're up. Uh, good morning, Chairman, Vice Chair, Supervisor, Staff, Virginia Ross Elections Director. So we're continuing our preparations for the November 8th election. The early board came in and started today. We have the live stream videos on the internet and we have ongoing poll worker training through next week with a few makeup classes at the end of next week. So that'll be the end of the poll worker training. We're continuing to update our poll pads and check all of those and starting to stock the cages uh, for the poll supplies that will be going out to the polls. And we're just continuing our everyday work that we're doing. If, any questions? Any questions from the board? Supervisor Kavanaugh. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ross, how many total employees do you have working within the elections department right now? Do you have that number? Eleven. Is that sufficient to run a successful election? Uh, yes, uh, Chairman, Supervisor Kavanaugh. We also have four election cycle, no, five election cycle temps as well. Okay, good. So um, I saw, I think it was in the county newsletter that we're short some poll workers or the county's asking employees to, to, to act as poll workers. Are we covered there? Do we have poll workers for all the precincts? Uh, Chairman McClure, Supervisor Kavanaugh, the employees for poll workers are going to be backup, and we, I think we're still short about 60. Okay. Is there, is there a specific place people can go to find out if their precinct is short? Is it too late to volunteer if citizens wanted to volunteer? Um, Chairman, Supervisor, there, it's not too late for people to volunteer. I believe the county has also reached out to the city and town clerks to see if they also have any of their employees who would like to participate. Okay, but citizens outside of government workers could participate, is that right? These, uh, Chairman Supervisor, these specific recruitments are for the backup to the poll workers. They would be county employees. Okay. Specifically, we wanted county employees to be at the polls as well. Okay, why is that? to back up in case the inspector has doesn't show up or to provide breaks for people. Okay, but, but, but a citizen couldn't fill that same role just if, if a citizen wanted to volunteer in a position that couldn't be filled by a county worker, could they also be that backup uh, person? Supervisor, I don't know. But a fr <laughs> I would have to talk to HR because when you use the word volunteer, that means they don't get paid. So we would have to, to look at that. So citizens would get vol citizens who volunteer for position would expect pay then. So non employees. Uh, Chairman, Supervisor, yes, I would believe so. They would be yes. But we have enough poll workers. We were specifically looking for county employees as backups. Okay. As a reserve, is what you're just, I mean, they're the reserve workers. Correct. Thank you, yes. Chairman. Okay. Um, that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? No. Super, oh, no, 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 I'm good. That was just a flinch. Yeah, that was just oh, like, yeah, okay. I'm good. <laughs> okay. Um, we are also doing the administrative review. Uh, Mr. Nelson, do you, thank you, Ms. Ross. Okay. Mr. Chairman, so, thank you. excuse me. We, we also had an update on two of the questions that the board had asked previously that I think the county attorney was prepared to respond to. Well, since you're standing, Mr. Volkmer, why don't you please step up to the podium? Thank you, Chair, members of the board. Ken Volkmer, Pinal County Attorney. Um, I know that our sheriff has reached out on numerous occasions. A number of the board members have received um, emails from concerned citizens. Uh, I believe we've had a couple people um, actually come to this very podium and bring issues regarding 
uh, the drop boxes and the ES and S machines, and I believe even last meeting, Supervisor Goodman had specifically said, hey, is there an update? Um, we are prepared to provide a very brief update, 25,000 foot kind of overview. Uh, there's really three issues that, that, that this can be sort of narrowed down to. One, um, there's an allegation that the use of ballot boxes in general is unlawful. Two, if you are using ballot boxes, they must be staffed 24 hours a day. And then three, our voting tabulation machines from ENS and S are not properly certified and thus illegal. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about the mailboxes. Uh, in sum, nothing in the Arizona Constitution or statutes prohibit the use of ballot drop boxes. Arizona law allows voters to return their early, early ballots by mail or by, quote, delivering their ballot to the county recorder or other officer in charge of elections. Counties may designate drop-off locations where the voter can, quote, deliver their ballots, including official drop-off boxes. The binding EPM contemplates that counties may use drop boxes. The EPM is the Elections Procedural Manual that the Secretary of State um, generates, and in 2019, that one was signed by both uh, our Attorney General and our Governor's Office, and uh, earlier this summer, I believe in June, a Superior Court affirmed that that is the effective uh, Elections Procedural Manual, the 2019 one. Uh, it also required, uh, that EPM requires detailed procedures to ensure the security when those uh, drop boxes are being used. Uh, with respect to the staffing, I think it's important that this board be made aware as well as the public. Um, Pinal County is going above and beyond what we believe any other um, entity is using. We um, have secure drop boxes. Uh, they are physically secured to the location, and each one is actually being video recorded. Uh, I know that, that Ms. Um, Dana, I'm drawing a blank on your last name. I apologize. <laughs> Lewis, jeez, I'm so sorry, Dana. Dana and the sheriff and their teams met and county IT met um, because when we did a review, uh, some of the trees had grown and the cameras were no longer pointing at the mailboxes or they were too far removed where we could not get an actual and accurate view of the mailboxes. We've addressed that. IT, county IT has made sure that we have adequate internet access. So every mailbox is under 24-hour surveillance. Both the elections uh, department and the sheriff's office has a plan in place where they're reviewing all of that footage. So all footage is being reviewed and we do have eyes on it now effectively 24 hours hours a day. With respect to the yes and S machines, um, nothing in federal or state law invalidates the voting system testing laboratories accreditation. That's who the yes and S machines were accredited by. Um, if the uh, EAC does not issue a new certificate every two years, because that's what the allegation is, is every two years it has to be recertified. That is something that's been reportedly told uh, to this board. It's been put in email. It's been alleged. There's nothing statutorily that requires that. Um, that is, uh, we're, we're unsure where they're even getting that, that information from because there's nothing in our statutes that require that. There's nothing in the federal statutes that requires that. Uh, there's also a claim that because it was uh, the chair, or excuse me, the executive director that signed the certification and not the chair, they're saying the wrong person signed it, so that invalidates it. Again, th there's no statutory basis in which that is, is um, rooted. Um, Arizona law requires that the electronic voting systems comply with the Help America Vote Act, also known as HAVA, and it has to be approved by an accredited voting system testing laboratory. The county's es &S voting equipment complies with both of these requirements. Um, so bottom line is, if we face litigation, uh, the official position of my office with consultation of outside counsel and literally hours and hours and hours of research collaboration is uh, we are above board and we would survive any challenge. I know it's a whole lot of word salad that I just gave you, so I'm happy to answer any questions, but I'm just trying to give you that 20,000 foot overview. It's not something we've ignored. It's not something that, that we've just said, hey, this is no big deal. We've looked into it uh, and we are confident in the position of the county at this point. Thank you. Any questions for um, county attorney? Seeing none, all right. Um, no other questions, then I would, uh, let's see, this is just a just discussion. There's no action here. All right. Let's move forward. How about item number two, discussion, approval, disapproval of clarifying resolution number 082620-ED, a resolution of the Board of Supervisors of Pinal County approving a fee schedule for the Pinal County Elections Department adopted August 27, 2020, to define the terms 10 cents per ballot under the election worker pay section to mean each card of a ballot. Ms. Ross, you're back. 
Thank you, uh, Chairman, Supervisors, Vice Chair, Virginia Ross Elections Director. Yes, we did want to clarify that the 10 cents is per card. We do have a two card ballot this election cycle, and we want the board's members to be paid fairly for the work, for the additional work and review they will have to do for the additional card of the ballot. And with that, I would ask that you approve it as presented, unless you have any questions. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Seeing, hearing none, I would ask for a motion, please. Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we approve item number two as presented. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you. Item number three is executive session, and I would ask for a motion to convene to executive session, please. Mr. Chairman, I move that we go into executive session. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. We're in executive session. But we'll be back. Oh, I, oh, that's true. Okay, I'm just recessing. That's true. Fair enough. Okay, then. Item number four, discussion, approval, disapproval to waive attorney-client privilege, attorney-client privilege, uh, and release all or part of the outside counsel's report from the Admi administrative review of Pinal County August 2, 2022 primary election, prepared by Brad Nelson. Uh, at this time, I have Kent Volkmer. I, it says you're the presenter, so you're up. I just I go by what I see. I don't know. I'm going to change those crib notes, Chair. <laughs> Good morning, Board um, Chair, members of the Board. Uh, Pinal County Attorney Kent Volkmer. Uh, as this Board directed quite some time ago, uh, there was a substantive administrative review uh, that was performed. Uh, we do have Brad Nelson, um, the person who actually performed that administrative review, just to refresh the board's recollection, the public's recollection, our office was not directly involved with this. Uh, there was uh, concerns that we wanted somebody completely outside, so we did hire an outside counsel. I, outside counsel um, is who actually um, Brad reported directly to, and his report was furnished to the board in an executive session um, within the past hour. And I know Brad is here uh, and prepared to provide uh, sort of a brief overview, kind of a 25,000-foot view, and potentially answer any questions that this board may have. And with that, I believe I'll step aside and ask that Mr. Nelson be called uh, to the podium. Great. Thank you. Mr. Nelson. Before you start, I'd just like to thank you for all your work in this presentation. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, it has been an interesting tr trail that I have followed. Um, as is mentioned on the very front page of the report, my focus was predominantly on what caused municipal contests to be, either be omitted or reflected incorrectly on some of the August primary election ballots, what caused the ballot shortages at certain polling locations, did county officials respond correctly and manage those particular issues? And what can the county do to avoid similar issues in the future? I have had the opportunity to see the, the almost weekly information sessions provided to this board from Director Ross and Recorder Lewis, and I commend the county on the course they are presently on. Many of the recommendations that are in this report are already being pro, uh, provided by the county as it is going forward and I uh, cannot say enough uh, positive things about that. In regard to uh, who I reached out to for this particular re report, uh, the various municipal clerks, the Arizona Secretary of State's office, 
political party chairs of the Democratic and Republican Party here in Pinal County, the vendors who support the county in the tabulation and the printing of the, va of the ballots as well, poll workers and poll observers from throughout the, the county. And some of those poll workers were first-time poll workers and some of them were veteran poll workers as well. They all appreciated the situation that this board found itself in on August 2 primary election day as ballot shortages occurred. One of the issues that uh, they had and is reflected in the report was the inability to communicate with the county on election day to, uh, to get some assistance on some of the problems that were assisting at the polls. As I reached out to your communications and marketing department uh, who was operating, I believe it's called the Citizens Contact Center, sometimes known as the 311 telephone number. That, to my uh, report reflects, was the only telephone number given to poll workers to call on election day. That was vastly different than what the instructions for poll workers in past elections. In past elections, if they had a specific problem about polls, they had a number to call. If they had a specific question about how to handle a, a, a provisional ballot question, they had a separate number to call. So on election day, as the Citizens Contact Center began to open at 6 a.m., there were already 20 calls from uh, the polling places on election day. As the Citizens Contact Center attempted to field those calls to the Elections Department, and this is uh, reflected in the report, the Elections Department telephone was answered, but the, the, the brief uh, answer was that they were too busy to handle any of the calls on that election day. So number one, communications uh, needs to be improved. I have seen the information that is being given to the poll workers during their training for the coming general election, and you guys are back on course for allowing the poll workers to communicate any of the problems that might occur during the general election. Uh, regarding the ballot shortages, uh, as I've discussed with the board in an executive session, the, and as uh, Director Ross has come before this board previously, there is a statutory requirement to provide a certain number of ballots. That was not done. However, as Director Ross has mentioned and as the documentation uh, also provides substance to, is, is that there was no particular party or no particular part of the county that was at detriment compared to anyone else. The math formula inappropriate applied, affected everyone regardless of where they were on election day. Pertaining to the municipal contest, as I was reaching out to the municipal clerks, one of the things that occurred in the preparation for the August 2 primary election were ballot proofs were sent to individual candidates for them to approve or perhaps edit how their names might appear on the ballots, but no information was provided to those municipal clerks pertaining to their ballot, which, would, which was supposed to be reflected on that particular ballot as well. Uh, on, I believe it was July, sec pardon me, July 12th, then uh, Director Frisk came and told this board that the information on AVID, the Arizona Voter Registration System, did have the necessary information for he and his staff to print the ballots correctly, but as an oversight, what he described as a human error caused that not to occur. Uh, Mr. Frisk said that uh, he had been experimenting with staff on a way to improve those particular proofing processes, but he didn't elaborate at that meeting. I did reach out to Mr. Frisk to get his input on this particular report, but my emails and my voice messages that, was left for, were, that were left at his particular addresses and numbers were not responded to. So I, I cannot describe how the municipal contests were not reflected correctly. Uh, I, I may have missed some things that you would like to address, but uh, I will tell you that you are on the right course now. Um, the, the training manual looks absolutely perfect. Uh, I've had the occasion to, to be within the elections department office to see how they are operating. Their challenges are being met, uh, and with uh, much of the assistance from this board and the county attorney's office. May I answer any questions you might have? Are there any questions from the board for Mr. Nelson? Mr. Cavanaugh. Thank you. You just mentioned the training manual. Is that the training manual for poll workers? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Supervisor Kavanaugh, that is correct. It is online. Okay. And is there a training manual or an internal procedures manual that you discovered in your uh, review of the Elections Department? Do we have an operations manual that tells the Elections Department the nuts and bolts, step one, step two, of how to operate an election? 
Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Kavanaugh, I'm going to give you a kind of a maybe answer to that. And that is, as I reached out to former director uh, Michelle Forney, uh, I asked her what documentation she may have left behind, and she did say that there were procedures manuals that she uh, authored herself, but we did not go into the depth of what, co what is covered in those particular manuals. Did you find them? Uh, I did not. Okay. Th they may exist, but I did not. Okay. And then um, the former interim elections director uh, was hired by another state in November, but was held on as a contract employee, as I understand it. For, for some time after that. Do you know what her position entailed? What did she do? Was she a consultant? Do you know? Uh, Mr. Chairman and Supervisor Kavanaugh, to, uh, to get some clarity, we're, we're speaking to Ms. Cooper? Yes. Okay. Uh, my understanding is, is that during her tenure, which was very short, there was only one uh, election. I think that was the Santa Cruz Unified School District election uh, sometime in 21. And so the demands on her office and her abilities was certainly much less than were on Mr. Frisk. So my question was, she left in November, and the, the county manager can maybe clarify, but she was kept on, as I understand, as a contract employee after that. Do you know what, did you discover what role she played after she left um, Pinella? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Captain, November of which year? Uh, th she left in November, I believe, 2020 for another job in another state. Uh, I believe she left in 21. 21, okay. Yeah. yeah. Now, now, what her status was is whether she was a contract employee or not during calendar year 21, I do not know. Okay. I have no further questions. Any other questions from the board for Mr. Nelson? Okay. Then I would... Don't go away. I mean, I'm not. Please have a seat, but, <laughs> but don't go away. Uh, Ms. Ross, would you care to comment on any of this? Hair and makeup break. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman, Supervisors, Virginia Ross Elections Director. I briefly went through the recommendations provided by Mr. Nelson, and I would like to say I do respect Mr. Nelson and his experience, and from what I could read just very briefly, the recommendations are sound, best practices, and part of, again, Arizona statute and procedures, well-established procedures, and Many of the recommendations that I've just briefly looked at, we are implementing, following, and I will be providing a written response, I believe, when to attach to the report just from an elections administration perspective, because that's all I can comment on the four questions for the primary that he has confined his report to on the elections administration part of uh, what he did review specifically questions one and two, which are technical, I would say, elections administration questions. And I can speak to, uh, again, I will, as soon as I'm able to leave here, to go back to my office and provide a, a statement regarding his, the recommendations. We'll cut you loose in a minute. Real quick, but to, but to answer Supervisor Kavanaugh's question, we have a uh, procedure manual that we follow in the in the elections office. Is that correct? There are several procedures manuals: the elections state elections um, procedures manual, and Michelle did author a procedures manual. I do have it. I've read through it. She had authored that. It probably, I would say, after this election, probably needs to be added to a little bit more, and. Again, having stepped in right after the primary and trying to prepare for this election, I would say going forward, there probably should be a, another review because there have been some changes since Ms. Forney left that need to be incorporated into her manual. Of course, but, but we have one, so yes. it's not like it's lost yes. someplace and we're starting from scratch. That's the all. Chairman, we do have a manual, yes. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Ms. Ross? Supervisor Kavanaugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And to, to add to what the chairman said, you're, you will be leaving sometime after this election. 
do you know if you can pre complete that elections procedure manual prior to your exit so that the person following you has an absolutely clear roadmap of how to conduct an election in Pinell County? Chairman, Supervisor Kavanaugh, I probably will be leaving a few weeks after the election, and I don't know, based on ongoing work that we have to canvas and so on, that I would be able to spend too much time authoring and or preparing any more um, to the manual. I really couldn't say at this point if I would have that time or not. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Ross? Not seeing any, then you should go and start writing your response. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let's see. So, Mr. Nelson, would you please come back? Hair and makeup break. Got it. So, in, in all of this, I hope we get lots of questions, and I know that I've received a lot of questions about, I mean, you're looking at operations and how we handle our operations. Um, I mean, I've had hundreds of, of emails, Supervisor Miller's had hundreds of emails, we've all had them, about no machines, hand count only. Would that be possible to do? Uh, in a word, no, nor do I believe it's uh, allowed under the statutes within the state of Arizona. It is just too cumbersome. The other thing that I believe that um, Director Ross has pointed out to this board is, is that we have a brand new law pertaining to the threshold for automatic recounts. The less you touch ballots prior to an automatic recount, the better the election is. Okay. And you refer to the law. Could, could I have... Uh, Attorney Volkmer, please step up and fill us in on the law. That seems to be your specialty. Chair, members of the board, Ken Volkmer, Pinal County Attorney. Yes, there's a, a, a push, uh, not just among our constituents, but among a number of counties to scrap uh, both the Dominion, the ES, and S, and any other machines and go exclusively with the hand count. Uh, the issue we run into that with that request is elections are clearly and exclusively a creature of statute meaning we can only do what we're statutorily authorized to do. There is no statutory authorization to perform a hand count. In fact, doing the hand count uh, would be a violation of law. I can all but guarantee we would be sued by multiple parties, uh, and we would be very unlikely to win. Um, at this point, I, I know that there are other boards that are considering this. I've spoken with my colleagues, um, both as county attorneys, as civil chief deputies, uh, we are all of the, the same mindset. Um, independently, we came to the same conclusion, and we've consulted with outside legal sources. We've uh, consulted with former state directors of elections, and everyone is of the same mindset. We can't do that. Um, the only reason Maricopa could do the, the audit that they ultimately did is it was a state action. Uh, the, the legislature authorized it. This board does not have the authority to do that. If this board were to direct a hand count, um, you would be putting staff in a very difficult position because you would be directing them explicitly to violate the law, which I would be telling them not to do. It potentially could put uh, our employees and everybody on this board in legal jeopardy. If ultimately a, a hand count is what needs to be done, it needs to be a legislative fix. It needs to be a state law modification. Uh, again, without knowing specifically, the governor would have to somehow call a special session. They'd have to bring everybody in and they'd have to modify that. Absent something like that, this board does not have the authority to order a hand count, and I would implore this board, do not go down that route. Um, there's nothing but problems. Thank you. Do, don't go away yet. So one thing that came up in this report was the statute regarding um, uh, ballot numbers. And I know some people will say, oh, my gosh, you didn't follow statute. What happens in this case when the statute was not followed for the proper ballot count? Or the not count, but volume. Thank you, Chair. Uh, members of the board, uh, you'll let me get on my soapbox for just a moment. Uh, one of the greatest frustrations I have is somebody who had never been in government before. Uh, I, as a 
citizen, as a member of the public, if I violate the law, there are very clear statutory sanctions that result, whether it's a monetary fine, whether I lose my license to practice law, whether I'm indicted with a criminal charge. If I do X, this is the consequence. Uh, I find it a bit ironic that the government who writes the laws writes the laws to, to make sure that everybody else pays attention and everybody else does exactly what they're supposed to. But when a government entity fails to follow the law, there's no consequences. Uh, and that's exactly what happened in this case. Uh, the violation is, and I, excuse me, the statute is ARS. Um, it is 16, I believe it's 508. Yes. Okay, I hear behind me, correct. Uh, Arizona Revised Statutes, Title 16, 508. Uh, ordinarily, when there's a violation of the law, immediately following it somewhere in that chapter and that title will say, hey, these are the consequences if you violate the law. If there is no consequence that's listed, then there's no consequence available to us. Um, so to be really much more short-winded um, than I just was, there's nothing we can do. It is a, a violation without a remedy. There's not a civil penalty. There's not a criminal penalty. So there is nothing that we would have to do to correct that other than obviously the board would have the authority to terminate an employee or within their employment sanction them. As Mr. Frisk is no longer employee, there is no reach that this board has to hold him accountable. Thank you. Any further questions? I have, I have no more questions. Any other questions? Seeing none. Okay, thank you, Mr. Volkmer. Mr. Nelson, one more question, then I think you're almost free. Just very quickly, you know, again, thank you for all the work that you did on this, and thank you for looking into everything. Just, just to make sure, and for the public's knowledge, I mean, do you feel that you had unlimited access? Were you, you know, in any way hindered in your... Mr. Chairman, members of the board, no, everybody was very forthcoming. They wanted to join this process in making things better as well. Um, that uh, is uh, certainly uh, something I have felt from Director Ross and her staff, as well as we're dealing with the county attorney's office, what little contact I've had with the recorders as well. Um, uh, no one, had, other than Mr. Frisk, not complying with my, re my request, or I should say not uh, answering my request, Everybody else has been very forthcoming and very candid. Thank you. All Mr. right. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. If you uh, have Mr. Cavanaugh, yeah. Thank you. Mr. Nelson, when you mentioned about David Frist not answering questions, I don't know the man, but at a news conference we mentioned, you know, any potential criminal charges and things like that. So if I were David Frisk, I wouldn't probably answer the phone <laughs> hearing, what, what you know, what we said the, uh, in public. But, um, and I think... A meeting or two ago, Ms. Ross mentioned a hand count, and the hand count is a sample. Could you explain for the public how that occurs and why? Um, I am not, uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Kevin, I'm not going to be able to mention that particular statute off the top of my head, uh, but uh, after a federal and state election, in other words, those are the ones uh, that are subject to a hand count audit, the entity, in this case particularly uh, uh, Pima County, is required to do no less than 2% of the precinct cast ballots and um, I believe 2% also of the early ballots cast. So you're, so you're hand count auditing both ballots cast at the polls as well as ballots cast through the early process as well. The determination on which precincts and which contests are actually going to be subject to a hand count audit is done by a random drawing by the political party chairs of the political parties within Pinal County. So after a federal slash state election, the political party chairs would come presumably to the, Arizona, to the uh, Pinal County Elections Department because the elections director is the chief election officer for the Pinal County. They would have different, different counties do it different ways, but in essence they would basically have a big fishbowl with a, with a button or a, a folded piece of paper with every precinct on that particular piece of paper. They would, believe it or not, actually first draw to see who draws first. Uh, that is the, within the statute, so there is a, a hat, if you will, that has Democrat or Republican in it, and that is the, whichever is pulled out, that's the first party that gets to choose the first precinct out of this very much larger fishbowl. So they pull out the precincts. Once the precincts have been determined, they then need to determine which contests they're going to particularly do. Again, 
without getting in too much detail, there's statewide measures, there's federal offices that also are drawn randomly, and then that is the um, hand count audit process. Then eventually individuals, again, representing political parties, will come and gather, for example, um, the precinct's ballots cast on election day at Precinct X. That ballot box will come forward with the seal still attached, presumably from the poll workers, I should say from the election tabulation site, because it came in from the polls to the county's uh, election HQ. The seals were made sure that they were still intact. It goes to the voting tabulation device. They count those ballots. They have a particular number that they're supposed to balance to generated by the poll workers. So the poll workers say, 202 people came to vote today. That's how many ballots we're giving you. 202 is what goes to the machine. They make sure they balance, and then they put those ballots back into a box, seal it up. When it's time for the hand count audit to occur, that, if, that's, if that precinct is one of the ones that was chosen by random, that box comes out. Again, the auditors are representatives of the various political parties. There is what I will call a monitor presumably somebody from county offices, that will have the actual number that they're supposed to balance to. So they'll open up that ballot box, and inside there will be something perhaps from the tabulation center that says, from the polls we got 202 ballots. At the tabulation location we counted 202 ballots. And so the monitor will actually take that piece of paper and take it away from the auditors. The very first thing the auditors do is they open that box and count the numbers of ballots inside. No, no contest yet. They just count the number of ballots inside. The way that they do it best is you count them in stacks of 10. If you and I and this board were together, you'd ha have a stack of ballots that you'd count out 10, you'd hand it to the next person, they'd verify that there actually was 10 in that stack, and you begin to set them back and forth in this particular manner. After you, as your hand count audit board, have determined what number you have come up with, you'll say, okay, we counted 200 ballots in that ballot. And the monitor will tell you, since they know it's 202, that you're off. They won't tell you how much you're off, whether you're over or under, but until you match that number there, there's no sense going on because the votes will not tally if you haven't got the correct number of ballots from the very beginning. That's just the process to begin the process. Then you have to count the number of let us say the U.S. Senate race is one of them that was placed. It's not just Mr. Kelly, Mr. Masters, and forgive me, I think the gentleman running as a libertarian, I think his last name is Garcia, but I can't remember. But you've got to do the same thing for those, including overs and undervotes as well. Because you, once you count up all of the votes for Kelly, all the votes for Masters, all the votes for the libertarian candidate, and all of the write-ins, and all of the people who chose not to offer with that office at all, it needs to equal that 202. If you don't, you don't go forward. And that is a time-consuming process. So as you're beginning to consider doing a hand count office, uh, pardon me, a hand count audit of the entire election, just imagine that process for every office going forward. But we do this and, and it should give folks assurances that our machines are counting properly and this state law and the procedures that are already in place sh can give us confidence that the machine and, and the, the ballots counted are correct. That is correct. Now, there is the allowance for a variance. Uh, so if, if, if we are a, an election board and let us say, for example, instead of coloring in the oval by a particular candidate, we underlined the candidate's name. The statutes and procedures manual actually tell you that if a ballot is cast uniformly up and down its full, full length, in other words, they've never colored in an oval for a candidate, they've always underlined the candidates all the way down the ballot, then there's uniformity, and you can say that's reasonable that that person was trying to vote for the candidates they underlined. But if in, or if they write a candidate's name who's printed on the ballot, but they put it in the writing candidate line, it also is determined, well, is that a vote for the candidate? And don't color in the bubble for the writing candidate. Statute says that's not a vote for that person. But I think a person would reasonably say that that is a vote for that person. 
even though they didn't follow the instructions. But if they don't follow the instructions, it's not a, a count. But that hand count audit board can, can sometimes say, well, even though they didn't follow the law, we're going to let that be a vote for a particular person. So there are some variances allowed. As you can imagine, when you're counting tens of thousands of votes across the state, not everything is going to balance exactly. So there are some variances allowed as well. And would you recommend completion of the operations manual for the elections department before our next primary? Uh, well, certainly uh, having uh, uh, Director Ross mentioned the uh, elections procedures manual that's provided by the Arizona Secretary of State's office. That plus the uh, election officer certification courses that the uh, uh, Secretary of State's performs uh, in the years prior to general elections are going to give a, an elections department and its staff a much better idea of how to operate the election at, at a local level. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions from the board? Sorry if I went into too much detail. Oh, no, that was great detail. Thank you very much. I no. really appreciate that. I think that will answer questions from much of the public. We. Oh. Mr. Volkmer has. Mr. Volkmer, you have something to say? The board has an action item before it. Before yes, we do. Yes, we do. Information to the board. Okay. Um, first, uh, the board momentarily is going to be voting on whether to release this, release it in a redacted form, in an unredacted, or not release at all, and that is Mr. Um, Nelson's report. The copy that was provided to you in the exec session has across the top of it in a, a bright red highlighting attorney client privilege slash confidential. Uh, in the event that this board chooses to uh, release a completely unredacted version, we have a copy of that with that removed, so we don't have any lines going through it. I don't want there to be any confusion. Again, the board can do as the board sees fit, but in the event that the board wants an unredacted, clean copy provided to the public, there is one prepared. It has been provided to Ms. Kennedy for release if the board so chooses. Uh, the second thing I was asked to, and I forgot my phone, give me just a second. Sure. And just as a comment, Ms. Ross is writing, not rebuttal, but she's answering some questions and adding to this as well for the agenda item. So, uh, Chair, I, I'm going to tell you why I'm saying this and make sure you're comfortable with me answering the question, but one of the um, attorneys for one of the parties reached out to apparently our recorder's office and asked that we put officially on record the number of ballots uh, that we ordered. I do have that number available if you would like me to answer that publicly for this general Mr. election. Mr. Volkmer, what's the number of ballots that we ordered for this election? 342,548 ballots were ordered. Which I believe is 110% of the uh, number of registered voters. Is that correct? Thank you. Just want to put that. Now, I was asked to put the number on the record. Obviously, it's the board's discretion whether that happens. And there it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we have a. We have a. Uh, I need a motion here to determine or some action. Are we going to um, approve this report to be released to the public, unredacted or redacted? Who would like to answer that question? Mr. Chairman, I would move that we uh, pub publish an unredacted uh, report to the public. And would you also, do we need to add on there that uh, Ms. Ross is going to add additional comments to the report, or not to the report, but... Mr. Chairman, I believe the way the action item is phrased, uh, that uh, you would release the report unredacted and instruct the clerk of the board to put it on her web page, uh, you know, hopefully before the end of the day. Uh, and you could then give Ms. Ross an opportunity to provide whatever, you know, additional data she feels free to provide and ask that that be provided to the clerk's office and be attached with this report once it's put on the web page. Very well. Ms. Kennedy, would you, if we do approve this, would you be able to have this on the, on the website by the end of the day? Business. Yes, that is if we do have that information available for um, um, Virginia Ross. But certainly within 24 hours. Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay. So may I get a motion? Some, or you already made a motion. So I'll amend the motion or correct the motion to release an unredacted copy of the report and publish it by our clerk within 24 hours. Is that sufficient, Mr. Keller? 
with, with the addition of Supervisor Kavanaugh of uh, allowing Ms. Ross, should she oh, so sure. choose, to, to uh, add additional comments. And allowing Ms. Ross of the Elections Department to add additional comments. There we go. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Very well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. All right. We are down to what are we doing here? Four. Four. Thank you very much. No, that was four. That thank you. I, I'm trying to get down there. Okay, let's see. Uh, presentation and discussion on economic development staff uh, secured to the services of Locate. In May 2022. I'm sorry, Mr. Smith. We'll start with you. Good morning, board. Um, this morning we are going to have a, a presentation by Locate Incorporated. Uh, Jennifer Hill and Julie Harris are here. Uh, to uh, share with you some of the results of a District 2 retail study. Soon after I took over in meeting with uh, Supervisor Goodman's office and with his staff, we realized that, uh, that, that this is a, a real focus and a need for the county. We have a huge amount of retail leakage that leaves that area, and yet we have uh, very few retail sites designated uh, in that area. And so... Uh, in May, after a couple of meetings with the, the supervisor's office, bringing in some retail brokers and developers uh, to get feedback, we commissioned this study with Locate uh, in May, and they are here to, uh, to share the findings that they have, uh, have come up with. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ms. Jennifer Hill with Locate. All right, thank you. Ms. Hill. Good morning, and uh, thank you for the introduction, James. Uh, Julie Harris and myself, we're here from Locate, which is a brokerage, uh, much like CBRE or JLL, but our unique uh, proposition is that we rely on cellular data, real-time cellular data. Um, last December, how this all started, uh, economic development did invite about a dozen brokers down to Pinal County with the intention of helping to understand that retail leakage and how are they going to attract the developers and retailers into Pinal County. Um, and then they had identified the, the leakage. Um, so at the meeting, I just happened to come down and bring an Esri report with me, dropping a pin on the Walmart on Hunt Highway, and within seven miles of the Walmart, there's over a billion-dollar leakage in every retail category. It was after that meeting that I discussed with Economic Development and Supervisor Goodman that um, how are you getting the word out to people, to developers and retailers, that you're, you've lowered your commercial impact fees, that you're ready to do business, that you're, your planning and zoning is, is expediting things. And they said, that's a great question. Um, let, how would you approach that? So it led to um, us getting involved in a study, and we kicked that off with the goal of helping Pinal attract retail to Santan Valley. After several months of research, we identified that this retail leakage problem has been an ongoing problem for um, quite a while. In fact, um, about 18 months ago, there was a Pinal partnership panel discussion with Jordan Rose and Jim Rounds and some additional people, and they at that time identified there was a retail leakage problem. In 2018, the Santan Valley Special Area Plan estimated the retail leakage at $900 million. Um, but the retail dilemma is is just a result. It, it's a result of multiple issues, and I'll get into that. Um, this is uh, a summary of our findings, which is about 163 pages, but I'll try and make it quick. Uh, let's see. Oh, perfect. So at our uh, follow-up meeting with Economic Development and Supervisor Goodman, this is what, after that meeting, this is what we heard them say, that how do we plug those holes in the retail leakage, that the 24 at that time was under construction to uh, open in August of 2022 to Ironwood, and that there was the plan in the works for it, it for over three years to be brought into Florence. Um, how does Pinal County promote additional businesses? Santan Valley has a great relationship with the State Land Department and the town of Queen Creek, and they wanted to improve the quality of life for the residents of Santan Valley. So part of our agenda here today, just high level, some challenges and objectives to know the community of Santan Valley, 
the targeted retailers and developers that we identified, the current condition of things in Santan Valley, Northern Pinal County, and um, some storytelling strategies. Okay, so as I mentioned, retail leakage over a billion dollars into Maricopa County. Um, there is definitely a need for additional retail and restaurants. There is um, one of the challenges is centrally located commercial developable land. Um, there's no downtown. There's no community gathering area. And largely, Santan Valley is known as an unincorporated area. In fact, out of 361 unincorporated areas in Arizona, Santan Valley, Santan Valley is by and large the largest in the state. Um, the objectives of our study was to perform a qualitative and quantitative study to help build the foundation of the Santan Valley retail attraction, retention, and execution strategy. We helped, we uh, identified parcels of land within that, um, not, in, not just commercially zoned pro, uh, land, but also state land that might be considered for community development. We, made, we are making a recommendation on, of some of the retailers based on the psychographic profile of Santan Valley and some active developers. I need water. <laughs> Sorry. And um, furthermore, the... <laughs> Uh, the lo the long term and overall arching thing was that we wanted to give clarity that this is a long term strategy that needs buy in and all hands on deck approach from economic development, the industrial development authority, the workforce development board, the residents, the community, the key stakeholders, everyone, and it and it's it's going to be a journey. So where do you start? You start with your community, and um, when we met with economic development and, and supervisor Goodman. We asked, why do people move to Santan Valley? And the answer was, they go there to raise a family. And that was clearly identified. This is the makeup of the three greatest psychographic profiles of Santan Valley. And 93% of the people that live in Santan Valley are young families. Um, they are earning about 80000 an uh, median income. They are in their early 30s, and they have at least three people under their roof. The second and third largest groups are the boom burbs, earning just higher than that at an, a, a little median um, mid-30s with three people under their roof minimum, and then just slightly under that, the senior escapes. Those are our top three. And if psychographic pro profile is uh, foreign to you, it's just a unique description of attitudes and habits and consumer behavior. Um, so that's, that kind of sums up your big groups of people in Santan. And just as an example, we did a small avatar of the Jensen family. Meet the Jensen family. They are first-time home buyers. They are tech-savvy. They've basically had the Internet most of their lives. Um, they have an SUV. They carry some credit card debt. They uh, are influenced by others' opinions. They are on social media. And their number one goal is to just free up time to spend with their families. <clears throat> so targeted retailers and developers. So the list that we provided is about 100 of retailers that are either not in Santan Valley or that could support a second location in Santan Valley. And it's based on the psychographic profile matching the retailer with the community. And this is um, just the most national and regionals. We didn't really dive into mom and pops necessarily. That would be more specific to a project specifically. So this is a list of that, of that group of tenants. And here are some active developers in Phoenix Metro currently that um, could be communicated with about Santan's plan to expand. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So current condition. Right now, as of actually last week, there are 16 active land listings in Santan Valley Zone Commercial. And nine of those are five acres and under. Five are over five acres, and one was unidentified. Not a ton of inventory of commercially zoned land in Santan Valley for an area that large. This is the map that was handed out at the very first meeting. The colors at the top are ind indicative of what land in Santan Valley is zoned commercial. And you can see, or maybe not, it's kind of hard, it, there's not a lot of it. So to quantify all that research that we did starting back in June, whether it was quantitative or qualitative, we, 
broke it down into a large SWOT analysis. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just quickly go through that. Great strength. You've got great. You've got incredible growth. You've had growth for over a decade, a, a meaningful amount of growth, and you're about 120,000 people with that median income of 80,000. So you've got. That's a great strength to have. Um, you have a community com- comprised largely of those of those families. You have a leadership that is very vested and actually lives in the community and wants to see the area flourish. He wants that they want to bring the um, the amenities to Santan Valley. The quality of life in Santan Valley is exceptional. You have affordable housing. You have amazing parks. You have open space, and you have that small town feel. Some of the weaknesses, which could be turned into opportunities. Um, at this point in time, there is no immediate freeway access down into Santan Valley. I know it's planned, but currently, this is just currently. Um, there's a lack of available sho- shovel-ready re- sites. There's almost no vacancy of existing retail in Santan Valley. There's less than 5,000 square feet combined. Um, it's historically been a lengthy approval process. That's the developer and retailer perception. There's no consistent dedicated outbound messaging outside of Santan Valley to say we're ready to do business. There's the perception that uh, planning and zoning is has been myopic or maybe um, difficult to work with in the past. There's no community gathering area. There's no downtown for people to go with their families and hang out with, with other families. Um, the transportation infrastructure, typically that leads the residential development. Here it's trailing residential development. Um, there are little to no multifamily units available currently, and there's a perceived competition that Santan Valley is slugging it out for tenants with Queen Creek. Sorry. So we've got a lot of opportunities. And uh, one of them is to educate retailers and developers about the population milestones, about how you've, you've got over 100,000 people down here, and their buying power is exceptional. Um, the proximity to Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport, that, that's a huge win. And, the, and then the future freeway extensions, the, um, the industrial that could uh, – future commercial industrial sites, because you've got the Union Pacific that comes right from Phoenix Mesa Gateway through Santan Valley and into Tucson. There, there is an opportunity for pri- private-public partnerships to develop additional sites. They could, they could revamp their permitting process to have it be more expedited. There's the opportunity to further reduce those commercial impact fees, and I know that they did that uh, recently. But in comparison to Queen Creek, they're still a little higher. The future of the freeway will change traffic patterns once they have those future exits going east and west from Hunt Highway all the way to the freeway. So some of that commercially zoned land is, may, may be in the middle of nowhere today, but in the future it might be on a future route of travel. Um, the development of, an, of the downtown to have the place for people to go and spend time. Um, entertainment, there's not uh, family entertainment. There's no hotels. Um, there, there might be an opportunity for ASU to bring a satellite campus. There's just, uh, the, and it was almost endless opportunities, and I, I could have used pages and pages for it, but that's just some of them. And then the threats, obviously, are continued uncontrolled growth, uh, the employment to housing ratio, the continued retail leakage if something meaningful isn't done to curb it, unrealistic timing expectations on how long it's going to take to put that motion and see it through, uh, and then as everyone understands, the inflated land prices, development and construction costs currently, and rising interest rates. And then, of course, uh, annexation of, town, of land by the town of Queen Creek. So just a quick summary. Continued growth, less than 1% vacancy, a large influx of single and multifamily development, um, and then consideration of other community daytime population drivers, such as non-retail employment. Santan Valley... It's in a unique position. They're the largest community and the second fastest growing county in the state of Arizona, one of the top three states that are growing in the country. Uh, Santan Valley, they're just, they're a unicorn. They, they, uh, they have an incredible opportunity. I keep talking about Walmart, 10 miles within Walmart. You have 260,000 people earning 125,000 annual income. And if you go out 15 miles, you're over 600,000 people earning 125,000 annual income. These are, this is a, uh, these are sound bites that the retailers want to hear. 
And, and to be honest, the retail leakage, it's not a demand issue. It's a lack of commercially zoned land, the increased cost to develop. Oh, sorry. There you go. Um, there's no outbound strategic branded messaging and a community-minded approach to create a sense of place. So if you, even if you had the retailer's attention, where are you telling them to go? That's, that's kind of been where you got the chicken or the egg. Uh, there's a large swath of state land off of Skyline, and I dropped a pin on it and went out five miles. And within five miles of the middle of 1,300-acre 13, land that's raw land, it, it, it captures 130,000 people earning 84,000 income. The target in Goodyear, comparatively, if you do the same thing, go out five miles from the target, you're at 119,000 people earning 86,000. So Santan Valley could definitely support big box retail. This is uh, just a, um, this is a page of the brochure that Phoenix Commercial Advisors includes at a project that they're going to be doing at Gansel and Combs across from the Fries. And the star is indicating where that development will occur. And this is what's going out to the retail community. And they're showing where the primary trade area exists with that yellow line. And you can see, even though this is landing in Queen Creek, by and large, they're depending on Santan Valley for, those, for the consumer to come to, San, to come to Queen Creek. And it actually extends into Anthem and Florence. <clears throat> Sorry. This is the narrative that has to shift. Santan Valley, Queen Creek retailer, retailers rely on Santan Valley, but Santan Valley can stand on its own. Again, part of that story is the retailers need to be educated that these these streets, and I'm sorry it's difficult to read, but these these streets in particular will be future freeway exits off the expanded 24. And those will change the traffic patterns of people going to and from work, and that's where retailers like to be positioned. So as part of our recommendation for phase two, and I'm sorry, I'll, I'll wrap this up, um, it was... We want to shift that narrative. We want to shift that narrative from commercial impact fees are high and residential fees are low to commercial fees may be further re reduced. There isn't any available space to Santan Valley is exploring the purchase of additional land or bringing community-minded community, <laughs> community retail and developers. That the consumer is going outside Pinal County for many of their goods and services. Mm -hmm. But future narrative, Pinal County is approaching the retail leakage from a all hands on deck holistic approach involving everyone and that the strains on retailers and roads will increase we want to shift that to new roads and highways are in the works phase two storytelling so as the next phase this does have to do with the storytelling santan valley like i said is in a unique position with the potential to define itself it has the population, it has the incomes, and it has a community to help build the brand of Santan Valley. It doesn't have to undo a mess. It's, it's just, it is, it's come into its time. And it, it has, as new businesses commit and as developments occur and changes evolve, those need to be broadcast uh, with the consistent brand, and that will help attract the retailers for Santan Valley. And that's it. <laughs> Sorry. Did you have any questions? Any questions from the board? Seeing none. Uh, Mr. Gav Supervisor Gavanaugh. That was an, I couldn't tell I if that was a nod head. or, I didn't know if that was a you nod or just marbles. a smile. No, I didn't hear anything. <laughs> so um, are you suggesting as the best solution a mall area or a downtown with uh, stri a strip center or you know what's the what's the real complete vision? Does does Santan need a need a downtown area that identifies it as the the cultural center? What's your recommendation? It's one of the recommendations that Santan consider putting a downtown together. I know there's some discussions about parks and recreation and, and being involved and maybe creating a master plan area for the community to come together. Um, it was also a recommendation, I, I believe they're getting a, an, a massive influx of multifamily interest. They've already um, per, uh, permitted, uh, approved permits for 2,200 units with thousands more on the, on the tails. And that comes in, in some cases with a request to convert commercial land to residential. And our point is, 
Today, it may seem like a good idea, but the long-term vision for Santan Valley, it might be short-sighted because those routes of travel are going to change. What might be in the middle of nowhere today might be on the way to the freeway tomorrow. And then you mentioned um, the current narrative is that development is too costly or too restrictive. Are there particular policies or procedures that you have identified to support that statement? So the town of the uh, sorry there is no town of santan valley as an unincorporated area they can't extend some of those fiscal uh, incentives to developers to come in and and help develop the area and that was one of our recommendations you know the work you're slugging it out for tenants but you know the casa grande and coolidge these are areas that are towns or cities in the same county and they're getting interest from lg and Nic nicola and um Frito Lay, and that's because they have consistent branding messaging, and they have the ability to offer those fiscal incentives. And Coolidge is an awesome town. Besides that, it is. You're right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board, Supervisor Miller? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You hit on a, um, an asset that I, I think the Santan area has never taken advantage of. That's a railroad a railroad and a freeway, you want to stop leakage, you create an industrial work, someplace where people can work three or four miles from home rather than commuting. And I think a lot of the leakage is because they commute to Phoenix to work. We know that. And they go to the grocery store while they're there and then right. drive back and yep. then come they home. I mean, that's, you know, right. uh, that pattern is easy to identify. And... Uh, Nine years ago, when I saw that map up there, I, it, we had uh, yellow and purple. Purple was the industrial or commercial, and there was no purple. Mm -hmm. And I, I've said all along, you've got to, to look at that. But those tasks are typically taken on by cities, mm -hmm. those you know, areas. And there's, there's two things that we see here as a board of supervisors uh, is... We don't want to be a city because that raises our taxes, and we don't want high density. And it's, it's going to be hard to, to convince these retailers to put something over there if one of those two things doesn't change. And that's just an observation. It's not really a question. I'm sorry I don't have a question for you. But no, you're, that, you're absolutely uh, right. I mean, our estimate was 80% of the people in Santan Valley go outside of the county to yeah. go to work. And you're right. They'll go grab lunch in Maricopa County. They're yeah. picking up groceries in Maricopa County. So. And then come home. Right. <laughs> so anyway, uh, and I think, I think it's a diamond in the rough. I do think there's potential there. But uh, until there's some leadership for to co make that more cohesive and, and identify themselves, I think it's going to be difficult. And I see the mayor of District 2 would like to speak <laughs> up. Yeah. Supervisor Goodman. Let's hear from the mayor. <laughs> Let's go to the leadership. <laughs> so um, this is one of the biggest things that has been at the forefront of our, my staff and myself over the last several years is looking at a lot of the issues that take place in the Santan Valley area. And this particular problem is not necessary. It, it's a countywide problem, meaning that the retail leakage that we're losing is actual revenue that we're losing from this county that should be in this county, and it's going to another neighboring county. And even, you know, even though Queen Creek has annexed into our county now, and you, you showed where that potential target's probably going to go, that's still in our county. And so, you know, Queen Creek, just like any other municipality, we need to help them be successful, which is some of the things that we've done in Casa Grande that we're doing here at Casa Grande. Grande? Casa Grande. Casa Grande. <laughs> Coolidge. All of these, you know, and so, and there's still a lot of opportunities here. <coughs> the biggest thing, you know, in talking to the town of Queen Creek, Queen Creek, um, with their town manager, um, John Cross, I just asked him point blank one time, what would you say the amount of revenue that you bring in, what percentage of that is actually coming from the Santan Valley area? 
and it was 38% of their general funds. It's actually a little bit higher than that. Good. It's, That's good to hear. It's between 50 and 60%. Wow. wow. So that makes even this argument even more so to where right now they're not a city, they're not a municipality, and who does it fall to as far as leadership or governance to help stop this? You. No, it's us five. I can't do this alone, guys. It'll be all five of us together looking at this and taking the initiative. At some point, this area will become what it needs to become. I'm a, we're going to be making some, you know, we've, we've got lots of people and good leadership there that are looking at that. But when it does become a city, if it doesn't have the revenue sources in place to help maintain the ability to sustain itself and retail and these type of things and, and business, the, the, the uh, industrial side, is what lends for a city to be able to support itself. So we're in a unique position ourselves as a county to help trigger that, to help move this forward. And to your study and to your point, so much of our area is state land. I think it was, Leo, what are we at? Like 60 or 70, maybe even 80 percent, right? I don't know the exact percentage, Supervisor, for Santan, but 35 percent of the available land in the county as a whole. Okay. But, but to your point, if you're looking at commercial, you know, potential commercial land, a significant portion is state land currently. Okay. And so there's and and there's so there's a big need that we need to be able to change some of these um, and to be able to work with the state land. We have a great relationship with them, to where some of the discussions already been taking place. We've already starting to have those discussions about some of these sites. The one that was brought up was the industrial an industrial park area which is right there around where the magma and the UP line come together around Arizona Farms Road, which, you know, a lot of that is state land, and that we could take that and turn that into, or, or working with state land to make some kind of an industrial park area in that area right there. Then there's the area that you identified, Jennifer, in regards to Post and Butte area where the Post Butte High School is there off of Gansel. There's a huge 1,300 acres there right. that uh, can lend itself some, to some type of, of uh, industrial, I mean, uh, commercial retail uh, center that, and even with some um, retail stuff going around it, maybe a community center to be there. You know, we've got six high schools in this area, six and I've said it before, not one public pool that accommodates any of these high schools. And so there's some good opportunities to partner with some of our stakeholders that are there, like the schools, for instance, the charter schools that are there. Some, many of them come forward and even offer to put up money. But they need the real estate to be able to do that. And that's where the state land could come in handy. Then there is, we've even got the development communities that have been a big part of what's taking place right now, the hiring of them to come in. Our local developers are seeing the problem. They've been great at developing and planning their own little small communities, but they've missed the opportunity on a regional perspective. And that's directly from some of these builders' own mouths. And so they're more than willing to pony up dollars to become more invested in this financially and so do we, as a board, have the ability, do we want to take on to help this become what it should be? We've got a hundred and something thousand residents there. You saw the, the mix of the families. And to help this along, and I'll tell you right now, the town, I see um, their town manager and their water guy here. And they've been a great... Um, partners with us over the years, and I, they, they would love to see this area become its own entity because I think it would add, add even its strength to the East Valley if we could become its own entity, and we've had these numerous conversations, and so there's a lot that we could do as a board here to kind of help move this along, just like we've done in the other areas like Lucid Motors and, 
and areas, uh, Nicola and, and all that, that would help and benefit us. So I've said my two cents were. Dude, I would like us to move forward. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did get a nickel out of it, did I? <laughs> but I'd like to see some of this stuff move forward. There's going to be some other things that we'll be, be bringing to the board that um, will be in partnership with some other, uh, as far as some financial investment that we're going to be asking the board and, and other entities, stakeholders in the community to participate in. I, I see my my partner off to the left of me is anxious to get into this. So, Supervisor Miller, throw in I, your nickel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, I, I, I do have a question. I don't know. Back when you had the, the demographics of uh, the young, the middle, the, the old, the old, like me, uh, <laughs> they... Uh, how did did they break down in, in population size? Did you have that? I didn't. You I don't can, have. I can. Do I'm, I'm kind of curious where, you know, where's the the biggest? Or which which of the three is the so of 120,000? 93 percent of that 120,000 falls within the psychographic profile of up and coming families, and so the balance of seven percent is almost equally oh. split between the wow. boom burbs oh, and senior you. escapes. So. so well, that kind of answers my question right. because, in the sense, um, having lived that life of uh, builder and developer and what have you, you, you drive till you qualify. It's cheap land. That's and and it works the same for commercial. I mean, it's all about the law, the land cost is what bases everything off of this. To the state land, I mean, I really wish the process to uh, uh, for or for entities to want to purchase uh, state land was simpler or a more an easier way to get to the completion of uh, uh, fulfilling that sale because it, it is pretty cumbersome. You got to, I mean, some some of these uh, developments take you know two, three, four years and a lot of money, and then it goes to auction and you might not get it after you've gone down that path. Right. I mean, so you know, there's there's some challenges there. Sure. Is that it? That's probably at state statute level that that would have to work to help get some of that in there. But anyway, um, again, as I said, I think there's potential there, but it's not just it's just not the five of us that are going to make something like this happen. It takes an investment by uh, people that want to see something built there, have a vision, a dream of you know of some type of a retail center, some type of an industrial park. I mean, that's what that's what it takes. And we're willing to be a partner in it, but we can't, we can't really be the engine of that train because they have to pencil it out and know when they're going to make money because it's all about making money. Sure. And so and anyway, but those are some things that I've just identified here, and I'm willing to help and work on trying to uh, put a plan together to incentivize a little bit on our side or what we can, what we can participate in legally and to uh, uh, see if we can attract some of these uh, other industries. Uh, just really quickly to Supervisor Kavanaugh's question about would it be a big mall, part of our qualitative research, we had spoken with the brokerage community, and they easily said that Santan Valley could support 200,000 square feet of additional retail today, wow. and that the future it would be interesting to see where it finally balances out. And, and, to, and to that point, it's got to be planned areas. I mean, we, have, we can't just say, oh, just keep building houses. I mean, you have to stop and right. say, okay, this area is here. And we have to go back to planning and zoning and say, okay, this area is going to be commercial. This area is going to be residential. This will be the transportation corridor. So that's what yeah. we're, And that's what we're looking at now in the background. I mean, to all this conversation, that's going on in the background, just so the public's not going, oh, my gosh, you just thought of that. So Supervisor Kavanaugh first, and then Supervisor... What's your name? Surdy. <laughs> uh, so this study primarily covered retail leakage, but I would agree with Supervisor Miller that we have to get people uh, given an opportunity to work within the county, to have office space, because if, if these builders build the retail and they're still going to Phoenix to work, all is lost. Do you know how much uh, available office space you have in Santan Valley? Zero. Zero. Do you know how much industrial space you have available in Santan Valley? <laughs> Zero. Zero. It's definitely a need. Yeah. And typically, like I mentioned, retail usually follows rooftops. It didn't happen in this case. So now you've got to look outside that, and the employment hubs is definitely something you need to consider. And although I, I 
cringe at hiring more consultants and more studies. I think the study needs to be done to, to pursue Supervisor Miller's original statement. Where are the people working? How can we get them here? What's the type of facility that's needed? I think that's almost more important than, than the retail. Mm -hmm. Number five. So Supervisor Goodman mentioned something about the uh, employment, as did Mr. Miller. It's my belief that if we finish every housing development that's platted now, we'll have plenty of houses. We don't need more and more houses, 40 acres here, 40 acres there. We just need to improve the quality of life that we already have. And right now, 80% of our county goes to Maricopa County to work. My District 5 is to the north of Santan Valley. I don't want to see it grow together. I want to see there be employment in between in the state land. And uh, as I said, everything that's planned now, there's, there'll be plenty of housing, but we need to get employment there. And then if all the people are staying home, then the investors will realize that these people are staying there. They're not going to Maricopa to work. And while they're there, they're shopping. Let's keep everybody home out here and work on uh, employment along the 24. Any other comments from the board? Seeing none. Thank you very much for your presentation. Let's see. Number six is presentation and discussion of a, rep of a representative of the Canada Arizona Business Council, CABC. Mr. Smith, you are up for the introduction. Chairman McClure, supervisors, I'll be really brief on this. Uh, prior to me uh, uh, starting as economic development director, uh, there had been a decision made to uh, reduce some funding for various memberships. One of those was the Canadian Arizona Business Council. Uh, one of our supervisors asked us to reconsider that and to bring uh, Mr. Williamson here today to discuss uh, some of the benefits of, uh, of that membership and to uh, have that reconsidered by the board. So uh, with that, I'll uh, introduce Mr. Glenn Williamson from the Canadian Arizona Business Council. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Williamson. Good nice morning. To, nice to see you again. Pleasure to see you, Chairman and Board. Absolutely thrilling to listen to all of this. It's been a fascinating morning. I, it's not something I do every day. <laughs> at, uh, but in my role as Chairman of EPCOR, I get to find it absolutely interesting to hear what you're all doing and thinking as our team is uh, very interested in the Santan Valley. I want to make sure that uh, we continue to have your county at the Canadian table. And to put that into perspective, the number one foreign direct investor country in the state of Arizona by a very large factor is Canada and Canadian investors. To put that in perspective, we have uh, 500 Canadian companies operating here in the state of Arizona. Canadian companies such as Brookfield making $15 billion investments in Intel. Uh, the land and real estate business of Matame Homes is Canadian. Brookfield Homes is Canadian. Uh, three of the largest private water utilities in the state of Arizona are Canadian. Canada's have a, Canadians have a very, very strong tie to this region, specifically into your region. Canadians in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta are horse people. They are agricultural people. They are capitalists. They know how to make money. They also know how to enjoy the land and be in the land and have the land coexist. You have rodeo people here from Canada every winter at a huge, huge rate. Those tourists that have been coming down here for decades have turned into snowbirds. Snowbirds have then turned into investors. Investors have then turned into friends of investors. And Canadians travel in packs. And we have watched this over and over and over again. We have watched it happen in the city of Maricopa. We have watched it happen in the city of Surprise. We have watched it happen in Glendale. We have watched it happen in Scottsdale. We are watching it happen in Yuma, where 50% of Yuma in the wintertime is Canadian. So these Canadians that come in really have an interest in this. Now, we unfortunately... As a state, we only count our tourists as people that stay in hotels. We don't count our snowbirds, which is really intriguing. 
the same way that in foreign direct investment, we don't count money invested in a region. So in my company, I've invested over $2 billion in the state of Arizona in water. It doesn't show up anywhere. Anywhere. Another one of our Canadian companies, Fortis, bought Tucson Electric Power for X amount of billions of dollars, but then put another couple of billion into it. It doesn't show up anywhere. Or Alimation Couchetard that owns all the Circle Ks globally, including the 700 in the state of Arizona, the largest purveyor of gas in the state of Arizona, has been upgrading all of their facilities. This is our network. This is what the CABC is. We're 100 members of CEOs and mayors and a couple of counties. And we find that we are about doing business, about making business. We are not about putting plans together. We are not about putting projects together. We are not about building consensus in a whole bunch of paperwork. We are people that know each other and say, do you know this person in Pinal County? Do you want to do something there? If you do, then we make that connection happen between our group. We are like a Tiger 21 or a YPO on steroids. We solely focus on Arizona and Canada. We keep an eye on tourism. We've been instrumental in getting us up to 220 nonstop direct flights between Canada and the state of Arizona. We just put 11 flights into Tucson with an airline down there called Flair that also goes into uh, Mesa that we were instrumental in. The same thing with Swoop, the same thing with WestJet, and the same thing with Air Canada. So we find that connective tissue was important, so we paid attention to that. We do very little in trade, because trade between Canada and Arizona and our counties is fairly flat every year up and down. The amount of foreign direct investment, however, is massive. And so our job is to make sure from an Arizona point of view that all parties in Arizona maintain a relationship with the pension plans, the banks, Bank of Montreal, just uh, we helped them coordinate a purchase of Bank of the West. We did the M&I transaction prior to that. And what we do as an organization, again, is we interconnect people back and forth. So I think it's important to understand that 17 years ago, we started this organization. About eight years ago, we were invited to make a presentation to MAG, and we decided at that moment in time that it's very important to have county boards of supervisors and mayors involved in our group because they are the ones, you are the ones, setting the tone and the tenor for the rest of us to follow. It is our job to make sure that you have a seat at that table and that it all just doesn't go to Maricopa or it doesn't all just to go to Pima or now Santa Cruz is all over this now because they have a bunch of issues in growth that they want to address, and they want to make sure they're at the table. And Canadians get 70% of all their fresh produce in the winter via Mexico through Nogales and parts of Texas. So this is a very, very important thing to do. We also spend a lot of time in making sure that we connect with Mexico, with Sonora, Sinaloa, and Chihuahua, because the manufacturing hubs and companies that come down here like White Claw, when they went into Glendale, have an interest in what's going on over in Mexico for another part of it. The same thing when Electromechanica, an EV company, came down. They went in and did that. Craig McFarland at Casa Grande is very interested in this because he wants to make sure that his region is covered and touched by that. So these Canadian decision makers that come down here, because it's very cold in that part of the world at this time of year, 87% of all private jet traffic at Scottsdale Airport internationally is Canadian. 30% of Desert Mountain is Canadian, and 20% of Silverleaf is Canadian. These decision makers are here. And do you know where those decision makers go every weekend with their families? To counties like yours. They come here to get out in the fresh air. They come out here to see what you're doing. They come out here to be part of what the Arizona story is all about. While they are here, you should be meeting with them. You should be talking with them and having a chat with them because those are the people that will turn around to someone in their organization and say, you know what, um, by the way, uh, I think you should take a look at this county 
it is something that is important and people want to take a look at this. Canadian REITs, decision makers of these REITs that are responsible for massive development, their CEOs and their chairmen have houses down here. They know what the Renaissance Festival is. They understand what it means to go out into your back, your back neighborhoods. That is really something that Canadians are still infatuated with. They adore it. They love it. And so we want to make sure that as your administrative process decided to leave the Business Council, we wanted to make sure that you had one last opportunity to take a look at uh, rejoining our Business Council, and we would love to have a couple of supervisors in our organization so that we have you to, in to be introduced to the decision makers that are here. Let me put another perspective on this. Canadians own 100,000 houses in Arizona or rent, own or rent. This isn't just Canadians coming down here with trailers from Alberta. We are watching an entire new generation of Canadians come down here. And 39 to 42% of them pay cash for whatever they do. And they come here for up to six months and do nothing but pay cash and credit for whatever they're doing here. They don't do a single thing to cause an expense to the region. All they do is come here to spend money. Canadians are sitting on right now $42 billion of tourism money, and they are dying to go somewhere. And Florida's hurricanes did not help Florida specifically because the area that got hammered was an area that Canadians absolutely adore, which means those Canadians are looking elsewhere. And that's important for us because as we have a state tourism office, we have found there is nothing better than the counties and the cities to be in control of their own destinies and not rely on just the state for tourism or just the state for economic development. This is your county, your responsibility, and your ability to make connections with Canadians. It's not like this is a country that has not got a footprint here. It has had a footprint here for a long, long, long time. Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Williamson. I believe Supervisor Surdy has a comment or question for you. Glenn, you didn't mention the mines. I think other than Australia, almost every mine in Arizona is owned by Canadians too, is it not? 50% of all mines in Arizona and 200 of 290 mines in Sonora are Canadian, and 80% of them trade on the Toronto Stock Exchange which kind of goes into what we were just talking about, employment. And for some reason, Canadians don't ship all the money home. They're content to leave the investment here. Correct, uh, uh, Supervisor. What we have found is that because of the transitional dollar values, Canadians that come down here that earn income or do things with their investments down here leave that money here and continue to buy other assets whether it's houses, cars, vehicles, furniture, buildings, investments in uh, an awful lot of mines. We just had the Toronto Stock Exchange here uh, two weeks ago, and we had uh, 38 people there that are looking to go up to Toronto to raise money to develop mines and businesses in Arizona. So that would be Canadian money coming down to these people in Arizona to fund their operations. So... So this is all great and wonderful, but it's all happening already anyway. How can we make it even better by investing and, and re-upping with, this, with, this, with your group? 80% of life is just showing up. Being at the right place at the right time. I went to a, a donor party last night with Honor Health. They had 175 of their largest donors there. They started a million dollar in donors. And in less than one hour, I walked out of there with six people that I did not know lived here that were heirs to the Maytag family, that were heirs to the IBM family, the Watsons. And what we find in Arizona is not showing up is our biggest problem. So you're saying that if we don't become a part of this again and have a couple supervisors, then we may lose out to other counties not only in Arizona, but in other states. 
I'm not saying I'm telling you you will, because those counties are showing up. Yes. They are absolutely there with us consistently. I'm going down to Nogales next week, and they are turning out an incredible group of people because they are tired of being left at the last end of the stick, and they want to change and control their destiny. So that's, yes, I agree with you. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions from the board? Supervisor Kavanaugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we discussed memberships early on and what those that are useful, and I, I, don't, I don't recall ever seeing a presentation from your council before, so this is good. And, you know, we are stewards of the taxpayer money, so we have to say, well, is the amount we're spending on a given project, a given membership, a good value for taxpayers? And so I think that's sort of the argument you've made today. Um, what is the cost of membership to your council? For your county, it's ten thousand dollars a year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, Supervisor Miller? Just a quick question. You, you indicated that we had been a member at one point. How long have we not been a member? Two years. Two, two or three years. I think maybe two years. Two years. Okay. I, I hate to, I hate to tie it to a death of an individual, oh, I but I think it was at that time. Right. Okay. I At least that's what my staff told me in our in our non it's a nonprofit uh, as well. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Williamson. Thank you very much, Chairman. Board, appreciate it. Thank you, Glenn. <coughs> All right. Item number seven: work session to discuss proposed changes to park rules, including rescinding existing West Pinal Park camping regulations. Mr. Taylor, how are you today? I'm fantastic. How about you, Mr. Herman? So far, so good. Good. Chairman Board, Kent Taylor, Director of Open Space and Trails. And dang it, I thought I was going to get some TV time today. Darn. <laughs> <laughs> My one chance. <laughs> so um, today, wanted to go over, if you go to the presentation, please. Somewhere in that mix. Go over some minor changes we've done that we are proposing to our park rules. Thank you. So our park rules. So we developed our, our existing park rules in 2013, um, and this was an effort to replace some rules that were in place from the 70s. Um, we've since modified those in 2017. Um, at the time we developed those park rules, we also did a separate camping regulations for our West Pinal Park. Um, at that time, we didn't have any camping regulations for that facility, and it was our first effort um, to actually provide some guidance um, on camping uh, um, at that location. Um, some things have changed since 2017. Um, number one, um, we are now on, have an online camping um, reservation system, um, which kind of changes the the uh, um, the menu um, on our camping um, at that facility. And we also have a regional, new regional park, Peralta Regional Park, coming online in January. So we wanted to take a look at those. We, we, um, given our, that existing set of rules and regulations, we really didn't have any camping regulations for, for, um, for the new regional park. Um, and we took a look at this, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll use the term that uh, um, on the old rules that our attorney, my attorney used. He said, we had a rule in our park rules to follow the rules in the camping regulations. So, so we just took a step back from those uh, regulations and the rules and said, what, what would make this easier um, and um, you know, less effort from our park users as well as our staff? Um, so the, the best thing to do on, in, our, um, in our estimation was to rescind those camping re regulations from West Pinal add the necessary camping language to our existing park rules, um, in that effort, it maintains some simplicity. Um, all our rules and regulations are in one place, and it also aligns currently with our current business practices in, in a, um, with regards to our online reservation system. 
We uh, discussed this item with our advisory commission last week. Um, they made a couple of minor tweaks, um, removed some, some words that they thought were a little wordy, about four to be exact. Um, and so the, the, uh, the version you see um, as our attachment is um, um, the one that has been revised per their suggestion. And they unanimously approved um, suggesting or recommending to the board to approve these as presented. So what would our next steps be in this process? Uh, this is our first step. We have to do a, re a work session with the board, um, get feedback from you. Um, we begin the public notice process. Um, we solicit public input um, and then schedule a public hearing for a future Board of Supervisors meeting, currently looking at some November 16th if we can make that schedule. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Very well. Any questions from the board? Supervisor Kavanaugh. Thank you. I appreciate your presentation. We're, we were looking at the rules, and if I read it right, uh, carrying a glass bottle and things are included. Is that? That's correct, and that's pretty standard within our industry as far as um, glass containers um, because that is, uh, as you know, sometimes the um, – Number one item for vandalism um, and misuse and, and picking up glass is, uh, is a, um, a, a, a bit of an operational challenge. <laughs> so, and there are some other items, and my concern is this, not having the rules, but the penalties are a class two misdemeanor, like leaving the scene of an accident is a class two misdemeanor. So if somebody carries a bottle of Pepsi, yes, it, it can present a danger, but do we need to have it a class two misdemeanor? I would... I would ask my I would ask my attorney for that <laughs> on why why that section is in there. Mr. And Costa. I can and I can tell you that enforcement wise, we typically lean on the education side, not on the enforcement side. Out there. Right. There's a saying that goes, uh, "Arizona, come for vacation, leave on probation." <laughs> and so that was my concern. If the if in fact these rise to the level of misdemeanors, I think maybe we should address that. Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Kavanaugh, uh, and, and actually the, the limit for violation of a county ordinance uh, is a class one misdemeanor, uh, certainly, so we're not going beyond that. Okay. There is enforcement discretion that, that can be used uh, when citing someone. Uh, certainly, uh, and I, I apologize, I didn't uh, scan the rules again before today, the language could be put in the rules to set that class two as a limit, not to, the penalty shall not <coughs> exceed a class two misdemeanor. That way, you know, you don't have to, there is in your rules that you have to charge with a class two misdemeanor. You could do something lesser if that was appropriate. So the rules can be written in such a way that that is the upper limit instead of an automatic penalty. Okay. So this is just a discussion item today. So we'll, yes. I think we need to look at that. Certainly do that. And, right. and, and I'd also add that since 2013, we have never cited anybody. Yeah. Right. Very well. Any other questions from the board? Very well. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Thank, thank you. Sorry about the TV thing. You know, maybe next time. What's that? Sorry about the TV thing. Maybe next time. Okay. That sounds like Mexico. All right, next would be executive session. Uh, I need a motion to, I don't do that. Do I, we can just, thank you so much. We just, we'll, we will reconvene executive session. Okay. Let's see, item number nine, presentation regarding one Arizona distribution of opioid settlement funds agreement. Mr. Volkmer, you're up. This is information only. There we go, I think we're good now. Good afternoon, board. Um, Ken Volkmer, county attorney. I do have to note that I missed one board meeting last week, and you guys have had me up here like 11 times today, so I'll be sure not to go on any more vacations. Um, actually, what I'm here today, uh, this is, I think, finally some good news. Um, as this board and the public is no doubt aware, for uh, the last three-plus years, there has been ongoing negotiations regarding um, the opioid 
settlement and lawsuit that this, fi- this county filed. Uh, just as a really high-level refresher, the county initially filed here locally. Ultimately, for legal reasons, we decided to join the MDL. The MDL uh, took place out of Cleveland. Uh, everybody in the state of Arizona joined it, and we came to one large settlement agreement amongst all of the counties, the state, and the inv- individual municipalities. It was called the One Arizona uh, Settlement Agreement. Uh, And what had happened is the respective defendants uh, told us that if you come together and we don't have to fight each of you one by one, we will sweeten the pot by putting additional millions of dollars in. Um, We entered into that over a year ago at this point, and we have finally started receiving some of the settlement funds. So right now, uh, we have received two um, chunks of the settlement. We have settled with... Uh, McKesson and Marisource Bergen and Cardinal, as well as Johnson and Johnson. So those are two distinct settlements. Um, you may have seen, and I think I have some of the. You may have seen this. This was on um, Arizona Central. So how will Arizona spend its fifty? Excuse me, five hundred and forty-two million in opioid settlement money. Uh, just so you are kind of aware, some of it's going to the state, some of it's going to the municipalities in the counties. So they, originally that money's being split. And then once it even goes to the county, we get a portion of it, and then it, it actually gets divvied even further into the individual municipalities. And then I have those real quick distributions, and I'll go through them. So of the money that, that we receive, 53.01% stays here at the county for county uses. Um, the next largest, and it is for a... Snafu, frankly, it was a typographical error, but they are the benefit of the error. Eloy gets 34.98% of all monies. Uh, I guess they played Monopoly and they got bank error in your favor, and it was much more than 40 bucks in this case. Uh, the next largest after that would be the city of Casa Grande at 5.54, Maricopa at 2.73. All of this was laid out in the one opioid settlement. Um, Maricopa County is getting, obviously, the, the lion's share of this. Uh, there was another article. I don't know if we have it. Yeah, here are our various percentages. This is of the entire settlement amount. So our county makes up more than 3.836% of the general population, so this is not a per capita distribution. It is a complex algorithm and uh, mathematical formula that includes not only your um, actual population, but also the number of opioid prescriptions that were written overall, that were written to your individual communities. And as you're aware, uh, a lot of our residents travel daily to either Pima County or Maricopa County to work, uh, and they also tend to visit those pharmacies as well. Uh, So what ends up happening is those large pharmaceutical scripts are being written in a different county, even though they're serving us. Now, they do count how many were for us, but also how many that were issued. So we are not accurately reflected on a per capita basis, but this, this was the result. I mean, it was a mathematical formula. This was the one that we all agreed to. But I, I would note, for example, you have a Pike County that has half our population. It's actually getting more money than us. Mojave, which has, again, less than half our population, is getting more than us. So we, were just, we drew the unfortunate straw on the way that that mathematical formula was calculated. Retail leakage. <laughs> Retail leakage, exactly. Uh, yeah, we're getting screwed. Um, <laughs> Specifically, though, and I don't, yeah, I can't go backwards. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I need to hit any of that. This is what I was just going over with you, and, and I'm going to put this in real numbers for you. So our, the very first payment that came to Pinal County as a whole was for $313,010.91. Uh, you then take that amount and you input against these numbers. So our share is $166,000 in our first payment. Um, Casa Grande, for example, is just a little bit over 17000 uh, Eloy, again, because of the, the Scrivener's error, is getting about $110,000. And it just it goes forth. So we've currently had the two different settlements. The first settlement was for 313000 The second settlement was for 356000 That is money that we have. That is money that is currently sitting in our account. In fact, Ms. Angie Woods, the head of our finance department and budget, came up to me and said, Kent, we've got to figure out what we're doing with this money because it's just sitting in our general account and it's not supposed to be there. Um, so once we get the money, we are then required to go through the, the actual settlement agreement and figure out how we're going to use those monies. <clears throat> uh, and that's really what we're here for today. So I wanted to tell you that we got the money. Um, we believe more money is coming. 
Uh, we believe there are more settlements that are forthcoming. And the other thing I think is important to remember is these amounts that I'm talking about. Um, that's the first payment of, in both of these cases, 16 anticipated payments that will be annually. So this money every year will get another one for 16 consecutive years. So there is some protection built in there. There is some consistency. Um, under the settlement agreement, the funds are supposed to be managed, um, audited, dispersed, and everything through the public health department. I believe Dr. Spears is here. She was here earlier. Yep, Dr. Spears is in the back. Um, we have spoken with Dr. Spears directly. Uh, she is aware of this. Her counterpart in Maricopa County said, we've got plenty of redundancy. We've got plenty of uh, ability and capacity to take this on. So in Maricopa County, their public health department is really handling it. Um, after speaking with, with um, Dr. Spears and her team, she said, we could manage it, but we're going to have to have some capacity built in. We're going to have to have employees that are brought in. And she said, if you want to figure out a better, more fiscally responsible way to manage that money, she's very supportive of it. Uh, obviously, I'm not trying to speak for her. You can ask her directly, but that was the sort of gist of our conversations. She essentially said, look, I, I'm not trying to micromanage this. If there's a better way to do it, do it a better way. Uh, so that's what I'm really kind of here. I'm presenting to you. This is a work session. Uh, the reason this is directly relevant to you as a board is you are also the board of directors for the public health department as well as the board of supervisors. So I'm really talking to you in your capacity sort of as the, the board of directors for the public health department. There are really three different ways uh, that we could potentially administer these monies. Um, one way is we could go to our municipalities and say, hey, let's pool our money together. You know, We've got 53%, but that means the rest of you have 47%. And if we put all of this money together, there's some really important things that we could do, some really big things that we could do. So the first kind of uh, direction that I'm really looking for is, is, is does this board want us to try and work with the municipalities or to allow the, us to say, hey, we're going to do our own thing, and each city you can do your own thing. There's not a right or a wrong answer, but we are required under the settlement agreement to at least have that conversation with you. And if ultimately this collective board says, hey, I think we should try and work together, then it would be incumbent upon myself, Chris, and our team to, to work with our local municipalities and say, hey, can we work together? So I don't need you to give me an, an answer right this second, but that's one issue. And then once you make that determination, there's sort of a secondary level, and that's there are really three ways that these monies could be administered. One, it could be on a, a kind of piecemeal basis. For example, somebody could come up, uh, they could work with county management, they could work with a uh, the chairman of the board, and they could add a uh, agenda item saying, hey, we're asking for this very specific <coughs> purpose for this money. Uh, I should note that the money cannot be used for general beautification or general betterment. The money must be used. It's controlled by a settlement agreement. It must be used um, to address the underlying issues that the opioid addiction in our community has created. So think treatment, treatment programs, think those type of things. You know, I think everybody would agree that, that having a robust, you know, little league team is wonderful, and we want to support our local communities and peewee football and all of those things. This money cannot be used for that. It has to be used specifically to address the underlying issue, and there are guidelines that are there. So getting back, one way is on an ad hoc basis where – Groups or entities could come up and say, hey, or it could even be county departments saying, hey, we would like to use this money for X. And then you sitting as a board of directors would say yay or nay. Um, a second way would be to um, essentially create a secondary board uh, that would answer to you, um, but it would be the board that would administer these funds, and you would run it in a grant-style form. So what would happen is there would be a grant application deadline, and uh, again, how I would envision that is there would be somebody from the sheriff's department, somebody in the county attorney's office, somebody from the board of supervisors, from county management, from public health, probably people from the community that would sit on, and organizations would say, hey, this is how we would like to use the money, and we would uh, give that money to them in a grant fashion where they would have to report back. How did you use it? What was it used for? What were your benefits and those type of things? And then on a probably semi-annual basis, we would accept the request, and then we'd allocate the money and then report back sort of this is how we use those monies. Um, the third way that the monies potentially could be used, and, and there's more than that, but these are sort of the three big pots. The third would be we could stand up a very particular whatever you're looking for. If you said, hey, you know, our county needs something for uh, pretrial services, and I'm not advocating for that, but we could stand up a pretrial services department and say, we're going to use this money to fund that department, or we want to have a county-ran, a county-funded, a county-sponsored inpatient treatment facility. 
Uh, I will tell you that this money isn't nearly enough to cover that, but you could say, hey, this is going to be a chunk of change to get us moving in that direction. Those are sort of the three different ways, if you will, uh, and really today is just about seeing where this board is collectively because Angie's given me all kinds of grief about, hey, we've got money here. We've got to figure out what we're doing with it because technically we're holding the city's money. Um, and until we have that conversation with the city, uh, we're, I won't say we're holding it ransom, but we've got the city's money and we've not given it to them where they can get the benefits that they're seeking. So we need, just need some direction from this board. Out of curiosity, Mr. Volkmer, um, so we talk about municipalities. What about like rural county? How do we deal with that issue? Because there's a lot of drug issues in rural county. That's what the county's money is supposed to okay. be used for. So this, that's a great question, Chair. Sorry, I should have went through the chair. Chair, um, the county, it's not for administrative purposes. You know, they didn't give it to the county to say, hey, it's really difficult to administer these things, so go ahead and, and throw this in your general fund or go ahead and throw this in administrative. Um, what they looked at when they gave us our 53% is our population multiplied by how many scripts were written for people in our county, et cetera, et cetera. So that money is specifically designed to cover Arizona City, to cover Santan Valley, to cover you know what I like to call the eastern seaboard, your, your mountain towns, Kearney, et cetera, um, Mammoth. And all, well, I think Mammoth's actually on there, but mm -hmm. some of our more remote communities, Oracle, which is not a, a municipality. So that money is supposed to be, if we have our money, it's really supposed to be used to, to the benefit of those communities. Okay, thank you. Any comments or questions from the board? You're just looking for direction here. Well, that would be our preference. I mean, eventually we want to have an action item, but what we really need to do is get a, a temperature of the board, if you will, so I can go back to my counterparts at the various municipalities and say, hey, this is what we're looking at doing. Are you interested in joining us? And eventually we'll bring an action item back where this board would take a formal action and give us direction specifically as to how we should be moving forward with these funds. What is your feeling for the cities um, joining in with us? So we did have preliminary conversations only with council for the cities. I, I've not went and spoke with any uh, city council members. I know that the cities at least uh, had earmarked some of this money for specific projects. That does not in any way mean that, that they would not be willing to, to join with us, and that was made very clear. But some of the cities said, oh, we didn't realize that we were talking about Sharon because we were just going to use it for Narcan or something. You know, let me give you Coolidge's example. Coolidge has $5,300 as their first settlement check. There's not a whole lot you can do with $5,300. You can buy equipment for law enforcement. You can buy equipment for your, you know, your EMTs. You can buy equipment for your fire department. But it's not like you're going to create a program with $5,000. You, you, know, you can buy life-saving stuff, those type of things that would be consistent with it. They may be able to help their city courts. And I'm only using Coolidge as, a, as an example. Um, but until what we heard, uh, Chris and I were on the conversation, what we really heard was, you got to give us a little more so we can go talk with our board. If it's going to be group, like what's the group? How's the, how are these funds going to be administered? Does this mean that the county is going to, you know, big dog us and take all of our money and our people get absolutely nothing? You know, one of the concerns, and rightfully so, is, you know, Maricopa is going to say, well, if you do something in Santan, that's great. But if all the money goes to Santan or all the money goes to Santan and Oracle or it never gets out of the eastern part of the county, our people didn't get anything, yet we suffered. So I, I think what they're looking for is equity, and, and really I, I think the cities are waiting to see how you act, and then based on the position that you're sort of taking, the cities will respond accordingly. Okay. I, I, if I could, Chris, do you, you were in the meetings. Do you have anything to add? Was that your take as well? well? Does the board have any comments? I, no, oh, I can count on you for a comment. Yeah. Supervisor Goodman. I, you know, I, I, for one, would like to, to get a feel for what the other municipalities, what their interest would be, and so before we actually, so I, I think the path that you're headed down there that you're alluding to, I think, I think continue down that path because I think there's strength in numbers of any type of whatever, you know, whatever is decided ultimately what, how to spend this money. Supervisor Miller. Yeah, I think if... If we went down that path of, of kind of a separate board, if they had representation on that board, I think there would be a more comfort level in, in sharing the, the, the dollars uh, in the location. So I would use that as the carrot on the stick. <laughs> see, see if that brings them in. I don't know. sure like to get Eloy on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be reaching out to Mike, I promise. <laughs> I think those are great directions. Any, anybody else? 
Supervisor Cabinet. Chairman, thank you. My recommendation would be to uh, use the money in a way that most uh, directly impacts the, uh, the users and to get people off fentanyl, whatever that looks like. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Supervisor Surdy. <laughs> Mr. Volkmer, did you, uh, for the folks watching at home, why Apache Junction is not listed there? Yes, uh, and I apologize for omitting that. It certainly was not my intention. Yes, you'll look. That is our sole municipality, that in Queen Creek. Um, obviously, Queen Creek has the majority in Maricopa County. Uh, for whatever reason, the formula that they used, if the jurisdiction was in two distinct um, jurisdictions, they went with the larger jurisdiction. So even though 95 plus percent of Apache Junction falls within Pinal County, that remaining 5 percent went into Maricopa. So they actually sent Apache Junction to Maricopa County. I don't believe it was nefarious. Maricopa County got a much bigger pool. So proportionally and residentially and per capita, they actually would get more money there. We have spoken with Joel Stern, who is the city attorney in Apache Junction, and I know he was going to be reaching out uh, to their public health department and their county attorney to make sure that the people of Apache Junction don't get left out in the cold. Uh, I, I would note that anything we do collectively, I, it would not be my recommendation or inclination to freeze out Apache Junction. It wasn't as if they elected to go there. That's just how the cookie crumbled, so to speak. Thank you. Okay, so do you feel you have proper direction at this point? I believe, I, I believe we have adequate, um, and, and I might be having additional adequate. conversations with everybody, but I think this at least gives us the, the direction to move to and allows me to start talking with the cities. Um, just to be clear, does the board have any concerns if I were to appear at any of maybe the city council meetings just to kind of discuss this with the city council? Well, provided I've got, you know, the, the blessing of their respective city council. I'd encourage city attorneys. <laughs> yeah, that would okay. probably help a lot, yes. Okay. okay. Well, then, if that's any other questions or comments? And thank you, Mr. Volkmer. Appreciate it. Thank you. Item 10, discussion. Don't go anywhere. Still yeah, me. Yeah, there you go. Discussion <laughs> approval, disapproval of the request to fund one probation officer senior position to serve as a specialty court coordinator subject to funding availability. Mr. Volkmer. So I just at the last um, agenda item described three different ways money could be spent. And the least, the least efficient way, in my estimation, is to piecemeal. Um, one off, have somebody come up, beg for money, you say yay or nay, and move on. But here you go. Nevertheless, that's what I'm doing here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I am here asking that we use part of the county's allocation of the opioid settlement funds to fund specifically a probation officer that would be tasked with being specialty court coordinators. Uh, what I'd like to do is just kind of talk a little bit about specialty courts, the benefit. I know Rob McCone from probation is here. I think he'd like to be able to address the board as well. Um, within the last few months, uh, we received an audit. And it was probably a little bit longer, but we've gotten serious about the audit regarding our specialty courts. So right now we have three operational specialty courts. Uh, we have our veterans court, we have our drug court, and we have our mental health court. Um, we had somebody come in, do a, an assessment, and what they essentially found uh, in the audit is we were not complying with national best standards. Uh, and then we said, okay, well, we're not complying with best standards, but how are we doing? So we looked at our success rate. We looked at our recidivism rate. We looked at how the individual participants were doing. And ultimately what we concluded was our success rate was less than the national rate, um, which led to the natural conclusion maybe if we followed the model, we would have better results. Um, we had, and when I say we, uh, it involved the criminal justice community. So we had, you know, law enforcement was represented, my office was there, the sheriff's department was there, the public defender's office was there, indigent services was there, uh, probation um, was there, and we had real conversations about um, the efficacy and the value of our specialty courts. Uh, and we gave genuine consideration to eliminating specialty courts in their entirety. You know, they are um, not overly successful in the best of circumstances. If you can get 50% success, you're doing pretty darn good. Um, and a lot of people hear that and say, boy, if, if you're, unless you're playing baseball, 50% is not very good. Uh, and we kind of looked at, but if we didn't go that way, what would happen? And when we started looking at the people we put in specialty courts, what we discovered is these are people um, that my office, when we make an assessment, we don't think they're great candidates for simply probation. Um, at the end of the day, they pose a danger to themselves and they pose a danger to the community at large. My obligation as the county attorney on the prosecutorial side, I'll take my civil hat off for a second and put my prosecutor cap on. My obligation is community safety. 
My job is to do everything we can to keep you as, a, as board members and your family and your loved ones and my loved ones and our community as safe as possible. What that means is if I'm identifying people as being a danger to themselves and a danger to others, I can't just send them back out into the public if I have other alternatives. Regrettably, my only other alternative is sending them to prison. I'm going to just talk very quickly about prison. I'm not here to, to bash or to denigrate the Arizona Department of Corrections reentry and rehabilitation by any means, but these are the cold, hard facts. 85% of people in prison have substance abuse issues. They are diagnosed with SUD, and they need treatment. 85%. Less than 17% before they are discharged from DOC receive any substance abuse treatment. When they come back out into our community, once they go into prison, five out of six, or 83%, will be rearrested within nine years for committing a new criminal offense. That means only 17% of people get out of prison and don't come back, don't get rearrested. It is a very inefficient use of resources. It costs us $35,000 to, to pay for them while they're there. And in the meantime, typically, their families are struggling financially, so oftentimes we're paying for their families, their children, um, with social services, government services, et cetera, and they're not getting the help they need. What our specialty courts allow us to do is to treat these people that we think, while they're not in a great spot right now, with a little extra help, with a little extra assistance, they can be successful members of our society. They can come back to our community. They can work. They can get jobs. They can, you know, they can be productive members of society that are being you know, the people that we want them to be, the mothers and the fathers for their children. So collectively, our criminal justice community, and I will tell you my office said, we need to do everything we can not to put somebody in prison simply because they're an addict, because they're not going to get the help they need. And this is really for drug court, but if we can get them in drug court, that gives us the best likelihood of them reentering our society or remaining in our society and becoming a productive member. To me, it is worth those resources. Because with these type of people we're putting in specialty court, they're probably going to go to prison if we don't put them in that specialty court. So once we got to that point, and once they sort of heard my pitch, they said, well, what do we need to do to really make our specialty courts successful? If we're going to truly commit, uh, and, and we've got genuine commitment, um, our actual presiding judge, uh, Judge Giorgini, I always want to call him Rudy, Joseph uh, Rudy Giorgini, is um, actually handling the specialty courts now. Before it was just, you know, it would go from, you know, six months, one year, whatever. But he's saying, look, I'm committing myself personally, so he's going to be the judge that's actually handling it. Um, I'm actually putting a bureau chief that's going to start attending these and being a part of it. You know, Rod's got a commitment from his second. He sort of has 1A, 1B, 1A or 1B. One. Michelle is committed to, to running this. But even when we made all those commitments and, you know, we talked with um, – Kathy at, at um, Indigent Services. We talked with Kate Maluski, our public defender. Everybody made the commitment, but we still found that we were a little bit lacking because everybody has the best of intentions. But we needed somebody to keep us within the guardrails. So what happens is everybody wants to do the right thing, but you end up looking what's in my best interest as opposed to what's in the whole's best interest. You know, I'm looking very much what's in, what is in the public's best interest. Well, sometimes the public's best interest is not the same as the individual's best interest. So what we concluded is we needed to have a coordinator, somebody that was going to have the, the authority and the expectation that if somebody's getting out of line, they're going to call us on it and to make sure that we're complying with the best standards. Um, so if my office is being ridiculous, somebody that's going to be able to say, hey, Kent, or Jason in my office who's handling it, you guys are all, you're out of bounds here, or Kate, you're out of bounds, or even Rod or the probation department or even the judge saying, hey, you guys aren't complying with best standards. We're overusing jail. You're underusing, you know, positive. You're only using negative reinforcements, whatever it is. The county doesn't currently have that person. Because I put so many people on probation already, Rod doesn't have that person that's there. He doesn't have extra bodies that are lying around. Um, but what we concluded as a collective whole is this is what we really needed to give this a fair shot. So I know I gave you a whole lot of stuff to get to this point. What I am asking that this board do is that you fund this position using those opioid settlement funds for two years. Um, treat it as a pilot program, as a pilot project. And what my intention is, is to look very carefully at what are the results are we getting. We know what we did. We did an in-depth analysis. We know what the audit told us. We're going to be able to track for two years and see where we're at. 
I believe we're going to show incredible success. I think we're going to do much better than we've done before because we've got excellent people in our community that are really going to work in the best interest. And then after those two years, I'll be very frank, my intention is to come back in front of this board once again and say, this no longer should be a pilot program, this should be a permanent program, and the county should fund this person on a permanent basis. But... If we can't show you that, if we can't justify the results, if we still tend to meander and we're falling below those national standards, if we'd fund it for the two years, it gives the board the ability, sort of a grant style, just to say then we're not going to fund that position any longer. So I'm not asking for a permanent commitment unless we can sort of earn uh, this board's trust and, the, frankly, the taxpayers' dollars uh, to continue that position. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions, but, but I know Rod has at least one case that he really, I think, will epitomize the type of person that we're looking about talking with, so you'll understand and appreciate how valuable these specialty courts truly are. Absolutely. Mr. McCohen, good afternoon. <coughs> Chairman McClure, members of the board, Rod McCone, uh, Adult Probation Department, uh, thank you for indulging me, and in, it's... I just find myself frequently following Kent Volkmer, and it's a difficult <laughs> task to follow. But I, I'm handing you a um, really a, a picture is what it is. And, and it was interesting earlier when uh, there, we were talking about uh, Santan Valley and the leakage of retail, and she mentioned storybook, you know, the, the storybook marketing. And this is really how we can. I would like to present this and, and simply tell you the story of Mr. Ed Heater. Uh, and this is one of our typical graduates of our, subs of our uh, specialty court program. Uh, Mr. Heater was a graduate of our Veterans Court program. He's uh, paid over $8,000 in his restitution. Uh, he uh, was earned an early termination from, a, from probation. He's gone on to be a small business owner. Uh, I've listed his tree service there. He's a taxpayer. Um, and pretty soon he'll be a voter. And if you see that pamphlet that's in his hand, that's from the recent Veterans Court stand down where our staff and our, our wonderful courts, uh, court uh, commissioner and judges are working with him to re get his rights re right to vote restored. This is what the value of our specialty courts bring. And, and, and I can talk about stats and, and, and everything else, but it's about people because we are in the people business. And, and this is what we're seeing, uh, and this is a result uh, of our specialty court. I want to also point out that uh, in addition to Mr. Heater, next to him is one of our probation officers, that's uh, Genesis Barrett. Um, if you weren't aware, she was awarded the Hank Porowski uh, Drug or uh, Veterans Court or vet National Award, and that's presented to a team or individual. It's a national award. It's a presented to an individual or team each year and only one, one each year to uh, an individual that represents uh, leadership, uh, innovation, in veterans programs. Um, so this county had that national award winner this year. That's, that's a really a testament to our, our programming and really a testament to the support the board has given us over the years. Um, I, I can answer any questions. I can tell you that there's about 250 ed heaters in our community today. These are people who are working, uh, paying taxes, and more importantly, they are parents and grandparents, and they're there to support their kids and their families. They no longer have the uh, stigma of the criminal justice system over their head, uh, and they're, uh, they're really people I, who I admire. It's easy being a probation officer. It's really <clears throat> difficult to be a probationer. Um, so with that, uh, I... Re I, I wholeheartedly uh, request that you support us funding our um, position, which will allow us to uh, continue with our specialty courts. Um, and I'll take any questions that you might have, ha might have. I think it's a great program. You have a comment question? Thank you. Supervisor comment Kevin. question. So the program is great. Do we need the extra position is the question. And Ronald Reagan said, no government ever voluntarily reduces itself in size. Government programs, once launched, never disappear. Actually, a government program is the nearest thing to eternal life we'll ever see on this earth. So for Mr. Volkmer behind you, um, is there, have you examined any underutilized positions in your office? Do you have, how many people do you have in your communications section, for instance? I'm. Chair, Supervisor Cavanaugh, this really needs to be ran through probation. 
Um, okay. th this is not something that my office can run. It really needs to be a probation officer that has that very specific skill set that also has that nexus with the courts. This is that weird situation where you've got multiple branches that are kind of bouncing at the same time. Um, and that is something that, that we did explore. And it was we actually explored whether it should be housed in court admin or it should be housed in probation. Ultimately, the conclusion was made that probation and their skill set is much more adequately um, suited to do that. Uh, I can get into a whole conversation with you regarding how our probation department is not adequately funded. That's not your fault. Remember, probation is part state, part um, county. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, it got so bad in Maricopa County, for example, Maricopa County doesn't even take state funds anymore. They took state funds elsewhere and said, we're just going to fund our probation department um, by itself. When we did countywide raises, um, Rod's budget, he didn't get that increase from the state, so the county had to pick up a lot of that stuff. So the, the issue is I'm taxing a lot of his resources. We've looked at it. Um, I, I'll allow Rod to talk specifically about it, but I can tell you when we looked at the various places, probation was clearly uh, what we believed was the skill set that was necessary. They're the persons that are most aware that have gone through the training. And again, that's from the state's perspective. That's from the defense's perspective as well. If I were the one running it, I believe that the public defender's office and the uh, court admin and some others may have some concern that, that now I'm sort of running and essentially going to be able to, to wag my finger, so to speak, out of court. And I think that creates potentially untenable um, conflict. Okay. So. Thank you. Chairman McClure. Uh, Supervisor Kavanaugh, if I could address that for a second. Um, I'll tell you, in regard to stories, about 10 years ago, we were doing yard work, and my son, I was explaining to him what I did and, and, and how we were trying to help people to keep them out of the criminal justice system. And he said to me, you're really working to get yourself out of a job. <laughs> and and I, would, uh, I guess I would say that your tenants are, 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 are well-received and it's my goal to downsize the probation department as much as I can during my tenure. Uh, and by doing so, we will have less – we're affecting the overall crime rate in, within our county, and we'll have less need for probation officers, less need for prosecutors. Um, not sure we'll ever have less need for, for law enforcement, but you may see, you may see our probation uh, department downsize. Any other questions or comments from the board? Supervisor Miller. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Rod, uh, uh, Mr. Heater actually trimmed my trees for me, so he is out there and about, and, and uh, uh, th this is a good success story. I think it, the the number that uh, that you and I have talked about in the in the past is the recidivism, and if we can see that. Uh, uh, decrease. I think that's you know one of the things that that's the measure that we're looking at and uh, the frequency in which that, that that takes place. And just like all the departments we have, we seem to be growing and we have more bodies to look after. And we just, I mean, I'm not big on hiring a lot of people either, but I think there's always these niches where we have to to find something that's a little more specialized and, and use, use uh, some staff that way. So I'm supportive of it, and I think you've done a fantastic job over there, Rod. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chairman McClure, uh, Supervisor Miller, I, you know, I was just commenting early to our finance administrator or finance manager how we, you have taught me a lot about limited government <laughs> and, and, and how I've taken on your, uh, your, your teachings over the years. And just to let you know, uh, if, if we have someone in, the, in our program who completes our program, after three years, their recidivism rate is, is less than 9%, which is remarkable. It's the general public. And, and the, the amazing thing about these courts is even though you don't complete it, just the exposure to the program alone reduces your recidivism rate. So we may not, you know, we've had over 600 people come through these programs. Our, our, our completion rate has been a little less than 50%, yet we're finding that even those who participated in the program are committing less crimes. Sure, at any level. Just at any level, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, education is a good thing. <laughs> so. Very good. Supervisor uh, Goodwin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, Rod, we've, we've watched many of the programs over the years. Supervisor Miller and, and I have had the privilege of being able to be, to observe the successes that you've had, and this is one of those. And, and I'm a big Ronald Reagan um, fan of myself. Um, there's some other quotes that he's made. One of them was, there's no right 
and he was referring to the right side or the left side. He said, there's no right, there's no left. There's on the up or down. This is an up project. This is an up success story that really we need to be focusing on is to what it's not only done for those individuals. And opioid problems and drug problems were nowhere prevalent like they are today. We're at a big time high of any time in the history of our world, in our communities, where these particular problems are a major thing. That's why I think success and the things that you're requesting here make a lot of sense. Good government would, would uh, this is a good government decision, in my opinion. So that's why I'm, I'm going to be supporting this. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor, I'm sorry, Chairman McClure, Supervisor Goodman, and, and your words are, are, are well spoken. And we are really, you, you, you don't go a day without reading in the paper, hearing about a huge fentanyl bust taking place somewhere on our border or somewhere within our county. And we're having to pivot the way we treat these. Our, our business is changing. So um, we're, our officers are having to take a different approach. Um, and, and in some instances, we're having to take more of a law enforcement approach in, in dealing with these situations. So our, our profession is really evolving. And, and I can assure you that uh, – the men and women of adult probation are committed to Pinell County. Our, our very, very goal is to make our community safer. It's written right into our mission statement. So we really appreciate our, your support. And I'd be remiss without mentioning Leo's office, uh, Human Resources, uh, who've really worked with us on our compensation issues and helping to help us retain the great staff, staff, staff that we have. We faced a situation where Maricopa raised their starting pay $10,000 a year for starting pay for probation officers in a short period of time. And unit retail's leaking. We have workforce leakage. So uh, the county, uh, county manager's office, uh, Mary Ellen, the, the HR department, Angie and her team have, have really helped us out. We are, we are 60% state funded. They have not pivoted so quickly. Uh, and maybe in the future I may have to come to you all for a little bit of help, um, just kind of, uh, to get us through a couple of years. So I do appreciate the time to speak with you. I always enjoy it, and uh, I thank you for your support. Thank you, Mr. McCone, for your comments. Any other comments from the board? Another comment from <laughs> Supervisor sorry. Miller. But to that point, uh, CSA is really working to try and help out with uh, uh, the compensation side of this thing for probation. So another reason to, you know, to support CSA because we – all the counties are uh, feel this uh, this pressure. So, uh, anyway, I just wanted to throw that in. Throw an ad in. Just there. throw an ad in. Thank you. CSA. All right. So you have more. I, I did forget to say the magic words. Um, so these these monies are limited. It has to be consistent with the one opioid settlement agreement. And I forgot to tell you that this request is absolutely consistent and specifically contemplated. So under subsection D one three, support and treatment. Uh, and recovery courts for persons with OUD and any co-occurring SUD, mental health conditions, co-usage, and or uh, co-addictions, et cetera. So this is something that was explicitly contemplated, supporting these type of courts, and it's actually written in. So these are designed to be um, illustrative, not specific. You don't have to find it there. This is actually written into this program. So it is consistent with um, the appro approved and appropriate use of these funds. And I, I apologize for not kind of leading with that because I should have. No problem. So after, after the magic words of Mr. Volkmer, uh, any other comments? None. May I get a motion, please? Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve item number 10 as presented. I have, second. A, I have a motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. Motion passes. Your magic words helped, Mr. Volkmer. All right. Thank you, board. Thank you very much. Uh, we're at item 11, discussion, approval, disapproval of the project list for the use of American Rescue Plan Act uh, state and local fiscal recovery funds, or as we in government say, ARPA SLEFR. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chairman, members oh of the board. <laughs> Heather Patel with the Office of Budget and Finance. I want to sort of give a little bit... Um, 
kind of a, a history or background so that we can catch up to where we are right now. The American Rescue Plan Act was enacted back in March of 21. And at that time, they designated funding to different federal agencies for specific purposes. So <coughs> those were given to, when they went to the federal agency, they were put down to either states or communities. They were done in formula grants or um, competitive grants. But what we've seen from that thus far is that um, we've gotten some grants from like the FAA that was specific to airports. We've got some from the Department of Justice that was specific to victims. Uh, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban, Urban Development that was specific to homelessness. Then we also received some funding from the U.S. Treasury for the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, which um, kind of was a rollover from the CARES Act, and then it showed up in the ARPA. And um, so we did all of these um, programs through ARPA. Another program that they created was the State and Local Fiscal Recovery Fund. So back in May of 21, they notified us that we would be receiving some funds directly from the Treasury. But it wasn't until April of this year that they actually completed the um, final rule, which was the official rule of how the program was supposed to work, what were the, the benefits, what it is that we were allowed to do. And they did provide us uh, a list of eligible categories. And these were for public health, negative economic impacts, to serve disproportionately impacted communities. We could do premium pay, infrastructure, and some administrative. And then we also have this revenue replacement portion. So those were all the eligible categories. And we took a look at all of the projects and activities that we had on the books or that we wanted to do or whatever the case was, and we identified those projects that would fit under the requirements of the program. We um, also wanted to, I, I do also want to point out under the infrastructure section is that it was very heavily on water, wastewater, and broadband. That's, that's the infrastructure. It's not for a road that would not be an eligible thing under that category. So before you is a list of projects and how we are proposing to break down the funding. Under our public health section, we want to do improvements to our public health facilities. Sorry, I do want to go back to say that ARPA is, it, it was a result of COVID. And so these projects are to, um, to make, it was, it was to designated for impacts as a result of COVID, economic impacts. So as you can see, all these projects are going to relate back to COVID to some extent. So the public health uh, improvements to our public health facilities, um, we have our medical examiner's building that we want to put some funding into. We also have a public health, sort of call it a public health and safety cleanup program so for low-income households, residents that have public health and safety issues in, in and around their home, we can help them with the cleanup of that. We also want to designate some funding to the Superstition Fire and Medical District. And then also the, um, to make a virtual courtroom for our court system, sorry. <laughs> We would also like to put money under the negative economic impacts portion. That is to um, do economic development activities for, for the lower income residents and disproportionate populations. So we want to do our workforce development and training center. Other economic development or, or tourism related, because those were uh, sectors that were very heavily impacted during the COVID crisis. So an economic support towards the fairground and their improvements that they're planning on doing. We also want to make improvements to our family advocacy centers. That was another huge thing that was a, a, an impact through COVID was the rise in domestic violence and, and things of that sort. So these family advocacy centers, we want to do some improvements to them. And then under our infrastructure, we have several water um, sewer, water treatment, um, we have discharge facility all in different areas throughout the county. Um, 
we have someone our, with our public health, or sorry, our public housing department. Um, some areas are there. We have some in some of un unincorporated communities like Colonial Del Sol uh, and Randolph. We do have um, some projects at our air parks that are water related. And then we would like to designate some funds to broadband. We do have some federally uh, appropriated funds that dwindled through HUD. We're going to couple that with this funds and be able to do broadband, broadband towers throughout the county. So that will help um, those people who are um, maybe learning from home or have businesses at home. This will give them the, the better capability for broadband. Finally, under the um, revenue replacement, what that basically is, is within the final rule, they did come down to say, okay, we are going to allow for recipients of the funds to have up to $10 million to do whatever you want with. It didn't have to follow the regular um, categories. And so under that, we do have um, that set aside. And we are not planning on anything for administrative or premium pay. I think that was all I wanted to cover. Did you have any questions? Oh, I'm sorry, I do have one more thing. We do have some of the departments um, that are here who would be um, handling these projects and the funds if you had any questions specifically on that. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Patel. Any questions from the board? Supervisor Kavanaugh. So under the ex uh, expenditure category revenue replacement, so, so if, I, if I understand correctly, if we, if we lost revenue, then we, that would be applied to that? Go ahead and answer. Okay. Thank you, Chairman, Supervisor Kavanaugh. In the original interim rule, that was the case, is you had to prove revenue loss. But with the final rule, they changed that, and it was just revenue replacement. We could use it for how we, how we saw fit. So in that case, we could do a road if we wanted to, but we do have um, ideas on other, other uses for that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the board? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Just, just one not, comment and clarification on that. Or through its voice, yeah. <laughs> Provision of government services. Um, we, we do still have to um, name and explain what we're going to do with that money, and what our intention is is to use that money toward the new elections facility, uh, which was one of the recommendations from the report that you heard earlier. And that's, that's because we have to purchase ahead of time for the long lead items, is that correct? Correct, yep. Okay. Any other questions from the board or mysterious voices from the far out? No, okay. Uh, in that case, I'd ask for a motion, please. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve item number 11 as presented. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you. And the one we've been looking for is adjournment. We are. My buddies from Queen Creek have been here all day. <laughs> <laughs>